Chair Goldfarb, we are now recording. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm calling to order the June 16th, 2021 meeting of the Boulder County Planning Commission. Due to COVID concerns, this meeting is being held virtually and information on how to participate in the virtual meeting has been posted on the Planning Commission webpage. There'll be an opportunity remotely, to remotely provide public comment on the dockets listed on the agenda during the respective vir virtual public hearing portions for each item. I'll provide instructions about that when we get to, to each docket on the agenda. All right, let's initially then take roll call. Let's see. Mark Bloomfield. Here. Leishan Gargano. Here. Todd Quigley, I believe is absent. Sam Libby. Here. Sam Fitch. Here. Melanie Nesky. Here. Dave Shu. Here. Gavin McMillan. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, planning commissioners, just a reminder, please identify yourself before speaking and speak slowly and clearly. All votes will be roll call votes. Please keep your video on when possible during the hearing. Please remain on mute until you're ready to speak. When you begin speaking, identify yourself as planning commissioner. For example, this is planning commissioner Ann Goldfarb. May help to keep your participant list open in Zoom so you can see who is speaking. The person who's speaking will be bolded. All right. Um, first agenda item is approval of the minutes. Are there any additions or corrections to our the minutes from our last meeting? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Commissioner McMillan, I move to approve the minutes from the April 21st. 2021 meeting. Is there a second? This is Commissioner Nesky, I'll second. Thank you. I'll go through the roll call to approve the minutes. Mark Bloomfield. I'll abstain since I wasn't there. Okay. Alicia Gargano. Approve. Sam Libby. Aye. Sam Fitch. Aye. Melanie Nesky? Aye. Dave Shu? Aye. Gavin McMillan? Aye. Ann Goldfarb? Aye. The minutes are approved. All right. Um, do we have. All right. It looks like our next item on the agenda then is the nomination of officers. And do we nominate for the chair first? Is that how we've been doing this? Anna, or I don't know if somebody else can help me. I thought we went the, this is Commissioner Gargano. I wasn't, for some reason, my memory was that we did second and then vice and then chair, but I don't know that it matters. Let's see if we get a, any input from staff. This is Kim Sanchez um, from Community Planning and Permitting. I don't think it matters as long as you. Okay. The nominee. Okay. All right. All right. Well, let's just start with chair then. Um, all right. So nominations are open for chair and I would begin by nominating Sam Libby. I'll second that. This is Commissioner Bloomfield. Are there any other nominations? All right. Hearing none, let's go ahead then and vote on that. Uh, Mark Bloomfield. Aye. Alicia Gargano. Aye. Sam Libby. Aye. Sam Fitch. Aye. Melanie Nesky. Aye. Dave Shu. Aye. Gavin McMillan. And Goldfarb. Aye. All right. Congratulations, Sam. Thank you. It's you. Um, do you want to conduct the nominations for first and second? Vice chairs. Sure. Yeah, I could take over. Great. Thank you, Anne. Thank you all for the nomination. Uh, are there any nominations for the first vice chair of the planning commission? This is Commissioner Gargano. I'm going to assume Mark Bloomfield's <laughs> would be. 
Uh, good number. Didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll second that. Uh, any other nominations? Okay, we'll do a roll call. Get my script pulled up here. Uh, Sam Libby, I, Gavin. Have you, Gavin? I think we might have lost Gavin. Oh. I, can see. I see him muting and unmuting, but I don't hear him. Oh. <laughs> With a thumbs up, Gavin. Um, yes. right, there we go. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there we go. All right, Dave Sue. Hi. Uh, Melineski. Hi. Alicia Gargano. Hi. Mark Bloomfield. Hi. Sam Fitch. Hi. And Ann Goldfarb. Hi. Okay, Mark is approved. Uh, we'll move on to nominations for the second <clears throat> vice chair. This is Commissioner Gargano. I think Melanie Nesky was interested in last time we did this. If they're okay with me nominating you, Melanie. <laughs> yep, that sounds good. Thanks, Leisha. Commissioner Bloomfield, I'll second. Okay, has a second. Any other nominations? We'll take a vote. Uh, Sam Libby, aye. Gavin. Aye. Dave Sue. Aye. Melanie Esky. Aye. Alicia Gargano. Aye. Mark Bloomfield. Aye. Sam Fitch. Aye. And Ann Goldfarb. Aye. All right, unanimous. Great. This is Commissioner Gargano. Gargano. Now you all have to change your names in Zoom. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia Gargano, Planning Commissioner. <laughs> uh, very good. Congratulations, Melanie. Okay, let's uh, move on past that. Uh, I'll get myself pulled together here. Uh, we'll go now for nominations, assuming that's completed, on to any staff updates. Do we have any or no? Hearing none, just like confirming, Kim, nothing is, nothing to update, okay. Yeah, sorry, I had my mouth full right when you um, I'm went. I'm sorry. Through. So that's no, okay, Kim Sanchez, Community Planning and Permitting, no staff updates today. Okay, great. Okay, so we'll move into our docket items for today. We have three items on the agenda today. Uh, and uh, at this time, we'll take a moment to explain the public hearing process before, before we get into it. Uh, there will be an opportunity to provide public comment remotely on any of the subject items for which we've specified that we will take public testimony during the public hearing portion of each item. The order of presentation will be to hear from the staff report first, then the applicant, if they're present, will move on to accepting any public comments from any individuals who wish to speak. Some people may have signed up in advance. Uh, we have the sign-up sheet here. We'll go through those names. We'll call on those people first. Uh, if you did not sign up for public comment, you may sign up in the chat of this meeting at any time. Uh, leading up to that that initiative or that uh, ballot item. Uh, please direct your comments to the board directly. The chair will answer any questions that arise during the hearing uh, or will direct any questions to the appropriate party rather. Uh, once we've all heard the testimony, the public hearing will be closed. Planning Commission will then discuss the application and take a vote on any action that follows. All members of the public will have a chance to speak even if you didn't sign up from the homepage beforehand. Once those who've signed up have spoken, we'll call for additional members of the public to speak. If you've joined by computer to the meeting, you can sign up by submitting your first name, last name, address, and the docket number that you wish to speak on into the chat box on the right side of your Zoom meeting. As each person who's joined by computer and signed up to speak is unmuted, Zoom will adjust your participant status so that you can speak and be seen on video if you wish. Once you're finished speaking, Zoom will place you back into the room as an attendee. If you've joined today by phone instead of your computer, you can raise your hand by phone by pressing star nine on your keypad and we'll unmute you so we can then call you to provide comment. When it's your turn, the system will request that you unmute yourself with star six. You can also check on your phone itself to make sure that you're unmuted from the phone uh, interface. And then once you're unmuted, either from your computer or the phone, again, please state your full name and address for the record before you provide your comment. The way the timing works, we'll have three minutes each to speak. Uh, and I'll interrupt you and let you know in three minutes or up rather than having that very loud timer 
buzz in the audio. I think that's right still. Uh, time can be pooled at three minutes per person for a maximum of 10 minutes. Each person who wants to speak at pool time will need to provide the name and address of the other people, up to three others for a total of four uh, besides yourself. Those people need to be in attendance and donating their time to you. Um, anybody who is pulling their time will have to be in attendance to the virtual meeting, either by phone or by Zoom, so we can verify their presence. It'll be a maximum of 10, of 10 minutes for those uh, four people in that case. Uh, a couple notes, please do not submit comments or questions in the chat box of the Zoom meeting during the meeting. The chat box is only to be used for speaker sign up. Please remain on mute when possible. Uh, we will be able to mute you if there's background information or noise coming through. Uh, members of the public giving comment will not be allowed to share their screens or the public comment. Um, applicants are welcome to share their screens. If you, the applicant wishes to present, please have your presentation pulled up ahead of time, ready to go. And then I'll announce we're ready for you to present so that you can share your screen at that point. Okay, so that's all the uh, preemptory things. So we're gonna open the public hearing for docket LE-21-0001 the City of Boulder Baseline and Foothills Trunk Sewer Replacement. And we'll begin with the staff presentation. Uh, thank you, Hannah Hoopley uh, with Community Planning and Permitting. Uh, I'm going to present this location and extent review for you today. I just wanna confirm that um, you all can see my presentation first. We can, we can. Great. Um, and I also wanna note before I jump in here that um, Chad Endicott did the heavy lifting on this one for us and drafted the staff report and provided the detailed analysis in there. Unfortunately, his last day with the county was yesterday. So I am standing in for Chad today to present this to you. Um, it is a location and extent review to replace an existing sanitary sewer pipeline uh, that conveys wastewater to the city of Boulder water resource recovery facility. Um, it runs through rural residential and suburban residential zone districts and the city of Boulder is our applicant. Um, the pipeline project itself includes areas both within the city of Boulder um, and this portion shown on the screen here that's actually in unincorporated Boulder County. Um, it will replace in all approximately 7,250 linear feet of sewer piping. Um, and I believe about 1,500 of that linear feet is located within unincorporated Boulder County and the subject of this location and extent review. Um, Chris Olson with the city of Boulder is here and he's gonna go into the um, details behind um, the need for this and the city's uh, wastewater master plans um, during his presentation. Uh, but in general, you can see where this location is in the kind of Southeast portion of the city of Boulder. Uh, near South Boulder Creek. And um, this is just photos of the location along baseline. You can see the character of the area on either side is um, kind of rural, unincorporated Boulder County. The project itself is um, replacing an existing pipeline and it does occur within the paved section of the road that we're seeing here, um, which really minimizes any impacts to these adjacent properties. Um, the purpose of the location and extent review is to determine whether a proposed public or quasi-public use or facility is consistent with a comprehensive plan. Um, and as I mentioned in the staff report, Chad did a um, really detailed analysis of kind of a, a variety of the elements that are relevant here. Um, I'm not going to go through all of those in individual detail. What I think is helpful maybe to see from a big picture perspective is um, that this is located uh, within the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan area. Um, and so we have analyzed the relevant ele elements from the BVCP. Um, in a, you know, particular relevance here are the criteria and the, the 
items in the BVCP about providing utility services, adequate utility services. Um, and that is the city of Boulder's responsibility to those within their planning area. Um, I mentioned the proximity to South Boulder Creek um, and that proximity um, in the uh, environmental areas along the creek result in quite a few layers that show up in the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan that you can see here. Um, riparian, wetland areas, critical wildlife habitats all exist um, along South Boulder Creek. We also have natural areas in this location, um, the Prebles Mouse Management area, um, and floodplain. Um, in this, you know, the combination of this habitat and the critical nature of it, you can see that the county and the city has, um, you know, invested in purchasing open space properties along South Boulder Creek to preserve this habitat and protect these areas. Um, and in summary, this proposal really avoids impacts to those uh, sensitive areas by keeping uh, the infrastructure within the right of way within the road so there won't be impacts on um, those areas on either side of the road. Um, and thus we're able to find conformance and um, alignment with the Boulder County Comprehensive Plan. Uh, this is the larger service area map and like as I mentioned Chris is going to get into this in more detail but the area that we're talking about is down here. And again, um, providing service and maintaining service quality within the city of Boulder is, um, you know, a goal, a goal captured under the BDCP. Um, we did send this out for referral and received referral responses. I think the primary one of note is the access and engineering referral response. Um, that referral really speaks to the need for certain permits, a utility construction permit. Uh, you know, the primary impact to um, of this project is going to be to the traveling public along baseline because it will require road closures. So um, those details will be um, worked out with uh, transportation, public works, pardon me, um, through the utility construction permit. And that is captured in the condition of approval. Number one shown here, um, just that the applicant should comply with the county requirements and recommendations from the referral responses. Um, and we're also asking for uh, revegetation and reseeding of any disturbed areas. Uh, and therefore, we are recommending that Planning Commission conditionally approve this docket, LE21001. Uh, the City of Boulder baseline and foothills trunk sewer replacement. Um, and perhaps just to take a minute and remind you here. Um, for location and extent reviews, Planning Commission actually is the approving body. Um, so you're not making a recommendation in this case, you're actually uh, would be making a motion to approve or, or an alternative motion if you find that more appropriate. That concludes the presentation I wanted to give to you. I can take a moment to answer any questions. Um, as I mentioned, Chris is here and he does have a presentation uh, prepared for you. Okay, thanks, Anna. Are there any questions from the commissioners for staff before the applicant presents? It's Commissioner McMillan, just just uh, one question about the uh, exhibits and the, and the uh, conditions of, of approval. Those letters are those the ones that they are they attached to the very end of this pack? Are those the the letters that we're referencing? Um, I just want to make sure I'm reading the right letter that they wrote that we're referencing. Um, let me take a look at the packet real quick. Okay, and, and maybe we can we can keep going. I, I was trying to fish through and find them. It's a big packet. I, I think they're towards the end, like page 415 or something like that, but... They um, are very end. It's attachment B. Got it. Okay. And those are the letters that are referenced in that condition of approval. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Sure. Any additional questions? Okay. Hearing none, uh, the applicant can present now. Go for it. I think we have you on video.
Can you guys can you guys hear me? Yeah, hey Chris, we can hear you fine. And is my screen showing up for you guys yet? Not yet for me. There it is. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, and thank you to, to Hannah and your staff for this detailed review um, for our upcoming, hopefully, project here. Um, we're very excited to talk to you today. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the details of, of our upcoming project um, and how we, how we got there um, as far as you know, planning and, and what makes this an important project for the city. So we'll go with a, a brief background overview of how this project was identified and selected. We'll talk a little bit about the, the wastewater collection system capacity and what the goals of our master planning process are. And we'll also get into a real brief overview of where the project is and a few key crossings and a few key uh, restoration requirements that, that we're expecting for this project. Uh, so to start off, uh, City of Boulder owns and operates a uh, wastewater collection system that's pretty extensive with 368 miles of pipe with 9,700 manholes. Um, all of the flow from this, from this um, is conveyed to the water resource recovery facility that's located at the south, just southwest of 75th and J. And all that water that's treated uh, is discharged to, to Boulder Creek. Um, so getting into how we, how we identify and select projects for our, our master plan. Um, it's largely largely based on the framework from the Boulder Valley Comprehensive Plan. And that, that uh, comp plan actually refers to um, the various master plans that the, that the city has, including the wastewater utility master plan. So our, our wastewater utility master plan has uh, three components, one of those being the collection system master plan that was most recently updated in 2016. Um, that plan identifies projects through a pretty extensive analysis um, of the capacity of the system, um, where some of the needs are within the system, and it identifies key projects that we can use to improve the level of service to our, to our customers. Um, those projects are then rolled into our capital improvement program, uh, which is where we start you know, pulling in Pulling in funding, pulling in engineers to get designs pulled together and hiring contractors to go ahead and, and construct those improvements. Um, so this project was identified in the 2016 collection system master plan. So it does have some, it, it does have backing in the, the goals that are, are provided by the, um, the framework of the BBCP. Um, so as we get into the, the need for this project, I want to give a real brief overview of, of why we need to improve some of the lines in our system. Um, I think it's pretty well known that there, there are a lot of infrastructure concerns throughout the country, um, and that's, that's no different for Boulder. Um, we, have, we have certain goals and we're trying to provide appropriate service to our residents and our ratepayers, and we are um, really trying to meet those goals. Um, so what we have, what we have have happen is essentially all of the all of the city's daily flows. We have no issues conveying daily flows to um, to the wharf um, and normal average day rainfall. You know, a, a small rainfall events. There there are really no issues. I'm going to walk through this figure and just give a little bit of an overview of of what drives how big pipes need to be within a collect wastewater system um, and. What we're looking at on the, on the, we'll say the y-axis here is a, a typical flow rate for a, a collection system. And then on a normal day where it's not being, um, you see these sort of ups and downs as people are waking up, taking showers, then it goes down in the afternoon when everybody's at work and then everybody comes home, they make dinner and you start to see this diurnal pattern. And you see this, see this pretty much every day until you get a big rainfall, rainstorm. And those rainstorms can vary in severity. You can have a, a two-year or a five-year storm that has a pretty high likelihood of happening in any given year. Um, and those are, those are smaller rainfall events. And you'll see, you'll see some smaller jumps in flows. Um, but we also have these, these big significant rainfall events. You may hear a 50-year storm or a 100-year storm, and you'll see much larger 
um, increases in flow because there's more water available to enter into the system through through some of the defects in in pipes and manholes and and things and the um, essentially identifying what type of storm we want our level of service to meet is identified in that master plan so we've established in our master planning efforts that the goal of the wastewater collection system is to provide service to the city um, at a 25 year rainfall event. So that's a, that's a rainfall event that has a 4% chance of happening in any given year. Um, and if we jump back to this, this previous figure, um, where that extra rainfall is coming from, it's through cracks in, in pipes, it's through cracks in manhole, it's through uh, poorly sealed manhole frames and covers, it's through connections from uh, downspouts or sump pumps. Um, there's no, you'll never find a collection system that's completely sealed, um, especially in some of the older parts of, of Boulder where a lot of the clay pipe and some of the larger concrete pipe has been in the ground for a very long time. Um, we just, we just aren't able to, uh, you know, address all of that right away. So we are, we are making an attempt to seal up our own pipe network. Um, through a pretty comprehensive lining program. Um, what you'll see on the figure in the middle, all these green lines are pipes that have been lined or they're newer technology, plastic or PVC pipe that are much less prone to these defects. Um, but even if we are able to line the entirety of the city, there's just as much pipe coming from private residences as there is city owned pipe. So the, the individual service line also has these same or similar defects, especially in the older parts of town. And those are owned by the homeowner. They're, they're not owned by the city. So even in a best case scenario, we're still gonna see some of those significant jumps when we get these large rainfall events. So that brings us to, well, if we can't totally seal up the entire system by, by making these repairs, we, we need to be able to convey the flow uh, into the system without experiencing these backups. So what we're looking at on this figure with these, which each of these little pipes, we have uh, we have concerning parts of town that um, are affected by different levels of service or different rainfall events. So these red these red lines here are areas where we have capacity concerns associated with a 15 year storm. Um, the yellow is Areas that are associated with a 20 year storm and the green are areas that are concerning for a 25 year rainfall event. So we have a lot of areas of town that the service needs to be improved to. Um, the area that we're talking about is generally in in this part of town. This is this is Foothills Parkway. Uh, this is Highway 36 coming up from um, from Boulder or from. So that's all mathematical modeling. That's every, that's um, that's all put into a a computer program that uh, presents those results and it's based on our on our GIS information. Um, there are also some field constraints. I mean, those those models are only as good as the information that goes into them. So it's really helpful to be able to calibrate and understand that, hey, what we're looking at makes sense. So this figure is is actually um, from a follow up to the 2013 flood. We we looked at where are there problems in town? Um, we actually surveyed a lot of residents and the the orange and the blue dots on this figure are areas where either a floor drain or a sewer ladder backed up into somebody's somebody's home or business. Um, so we're able to use this and compare it to the, the information that we have from that modeling and we can identify where a lot of the priorities are, where a lot of the problem areas of town are. So in doing that, in going through that effort, we identified a, a pretty long list of capacity improvements that are needed. Um, four of those have been identified as the large or the highest priority projects for the city. Uh, one is the main interceptor that starts at Western Disposal and goes up to up to the treatment facility at 75th and J. Um, one is the Goose Creek project, which is within the city limits. Um, that the first phase of that project has been been completed. Um, we have the Arapaho project sort of in the, the south and east part of town and into the, the county over there. And we also have the baseline and foothills project that we're talking about today. So 
The baseline and foothills project is incorporating the sanitary sewer service to the areas. Um, it's it's basically just north of um, of 28th as you're coming into town and peeling off up north to um, to go up Foothills Parkway here. Um, Foothills almost intersects the the center of the service area. So all this area in yellow is are the residents that are having their service improved with this project. Um, this is just an example of some of the things that happen when we do have surcharge sewer lines and, and backups. If we open this up and we have this in our system, if anybody's basement is lower than the level of this road, um, the water level in that basement will be the same as in this manhole. So we we have concerns with uh, folks having flooding in their, you know, in these in these areas. I mean, even even if you're down the hill from this, you'll have the same the same thing happening. So it's very it's it's a very concerning area of town, and it's something that we really want to get addressed as soon as possible. Um, so look, jumping back to this this previous figure, uh, showing where those where those backups have historically been. Um, this is the service area that we're looking at improving. So it's a I mean it's certainly not taking care of the entire you know all of the city's problems, but it's a pretty it, it's it's addressing a, a pretty good cluster in this area. Uh, project elements. Um, so we have a range of, of sewer sizes. Um, and I'm going to go from east or downstream to upstream from, from east to west. Um, the westernmost point is on a City of Boulder owned OSMP Oliver property. There's about there's a little less than 400 feet of pipe on this that we have to put in an existing or parallel to an existing line just to make some, some tie-ins. Um, there's some 27 inch sewer line within the right of way, um, sort of between, this is a city of Boulder um, property here. There are some, there are some residents down on this, the Southern side. And um, this is 55th at this point. Uh, this is the Islamic center here. And then as we continue from, continue to the West, we have a 24 inch sewer line. This is all within the city limits um, where, where based line is four lanes with a median in this area um, and then it turns to the no, to, sorry to the south and we're replacing some lines parallel to uh, Foothills Parkway so this is this is Thunderbird Court this is a frontage road um, near the Colorado Athletic Club Fraser Meadows and this uh, supermarket strip mall area so the area that we're really talking about today um, Hannah mentioned this uh, this is the this is generally the Boulder County right away. Um, and they're, they're a little bit, they kind of bounce around a little bit, but um, predominantly this is this is county right away in this area. So this is what we're really looking at. Um, a few other critical components of the project. We have um, a couple of ditch crossings that we're, we're going to be making. Um, we cross Howard Ditch in two locations. Um, those will be, those are planned to be open cut and we are in negotiation with those ditch companies um, as we as we speak or as we're virtually speaking here we those are in for review with those ditch companies um, so that's Howard has two crossings and Dry Creek ditch number two has one uh, those companies are typically concerned with anytime you cross their their ditch they're concerned with a more purple um, bedding material that that would go underneath the uh, underneath their ditch or their culvert um, potentially being a pathway for them to lose water. So we, we need special agreements and we need to um, have some engineering solutions in place to make sure that we, we're minimizing any, any potential impacts there. It's much less so when we're, when we're going under a, a culvert because the culvert in theory should predominantly be uh, um, impermeable, but uh, you know, from the side you know, shoulders and the sides of the roads, we want to make sure that we're limiting the potential for water to travel down that, that path. So we have uh, clay trench dams that are installed on each side of, of those crossings. Um, we also have a, a city-owned culvert crossing. Um, in order to minimize any impacts, if, if there is a significant storm event, we don't want all that water going directly into our construction site. So we want to keep that culvert operational during construction, as well as not having to rebuild it because it'd be a very expensive, I mean, it's a bridge, it'd be expensive 
to rebuild. Um, so we are planning to tunnel under that culvert where we push a we push a steel sleeve through with a, either a, an auger inside it is augering the material or a couple of um, a couple of people go at the end of the tunnel and they're in there with jackhammers and pitchforks and they're and they're pulling everything out. Um, and then once that material is rammed into that that sleeve is rammed into place, we sleeve a, a, the actual sewer line through it, and then um, we're able to make that connection without disturbing the culvert above. Uh, another pretty important piece of this project is uh, making sure that we're, as we are in the right of way, that we're taking care of the road. Um, so we are working with the transportation department for long-term restoration plans. Um, so we are directly in contact with Mike Thomas and his team, um, you know, developing those agreements and getting those in place. And lastly, um, there are, while most of the project is within the right-of-way, there is that 400 feet or so that's uh, on the OSMP property. Um, so it's very important that we restore that to its current state. So we, um, we do have agreements that are in development with our own OSMP staff for the work that's being done on their property. Um, and I just wanted to show an example of, uh, this was the Carter Lake pipeline, um, sort of a before and after, um, about a year after the, the project was complete. You know, that's the sort of thing that we expect, expect to do here. Uh, so with that, that, that concludes the, my applicant presentation. Um, we do have, we do have folks on the line from um, both our engineer and other folks at the city. If we do have any specific questions, we'd be more than happy to, to answer them. Okay, thank, thank you, Chris, for the presentation. That was great. Uh, do we have any questions for the applicant? This is Commissioner Goldfarb. Um, <clears throat> as was mentioned earlier, um, it seems as though traffic is going to be a, a real issue during this construction project. And it looks like you've really done a lot of work on that and set out alternative routes and how you expect that all that's going to go. Is there some flexibility in that if, if problems develop that you haven't seen? Um, or anticipated rather as as you go through this project? I mean, there's always with with construction projects, there's always um, there's always flexibility to sort of ebb and, and move. I would say I would say that without a without a very compelling um, concern, it would it would take a lot for us to change the alignment to have those um, threatened endangered species impacts that would be required to move the pipe to a place that, you know, that we could keep the road open the whole time. Um, the let me, stop, let me stop you right there real quick because I, I don't think that I made myself clear. I'm not talking about the construction site itself. I'm talking about what you've anticipated as detours around all of that. Um, yeah. So so will there be will there be signs telling people that's the way to go and you know if that gets to be problematic will you revisit that and see if there are other possibilities yeah there there's there are definitely alternative routes that we could look at if there are if there are concerns with um the routes that are proposed for sure there, okay there that was the only thing that i was that i was my question was about so okay. i appreciate and, that and we thank you Yep. And to, sorry, to, to pile on, we would expect to be putting up um, messaging prior to, you know, well in advance of, of closures occurring, um, as well as, as well as sending out mailers to the, to the neighbors um, in the area. So we're trying to catch, trying to catch both commuters and, and neighbors with, uh, with this. So Great. Okay. hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner McMillan, just one. How, how do you plan to address um, bicycle traffic through this area? 
while under construction. I know that I think the section of baseline sees a lot of, of bicycle traffic. I'm just curious to your approach. Um, there is a there is a bicycle detour um, that I believe is in the application materials. Um, I think we did. I may need to dig it up. It might take me a minute to find it, but I'd be happy to. Um, I'd happy to pass that. Be happy to pass that along to you. I I assume that uh, it was considered, and, and I'm sorry if I, I missed it in the in the permit. But um, my main concern is that we're addressing and thinking about bicycles uh, the same way that we're thinking about cars, and it sounds like you are. So. Yeah, we we are. We there there's not a there's not a scenario where we would we would want to put bicycles through this construction site. That's a that's a huge risk. So we definitely, especially in especially in Boulder, we know a lot about bicycles. All right, hearing no further questions for the applicant, we'll move into public testimony. We had no early signups, nothing in the chat, and no one who's joined by phone that I can tell. So I'll give a second for anybody from the public who wants to speak to either uh, enter their name in the chat box or raise their hand so we don't cut anybody out. Otherwise, we'll move on. All right, hearing and seeing none, we'll move on past that. Um, any final questions for uh, staff or the applicant and any clarifying statements from staff you'd like to add? I don't have anything further. Chair Libby, this is Anna Milner, staff. I do see an attendee has raised their hand. Um, Lori, if you'd like to speak, hmm. please put your name and address in the chat box by pressing the chat icon at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, we'll assume you're speaking to another item. Okay, not seeing any note from Lori. I think we can move on, Anna, is that okay? Thank you, yes. Okay. Um, sorry if that didn't work out for you. Um, okay, were there any uh, final questions from the commissioners for staff or the applicant? Hearing none, uh, were there any clarifying statements from staff? I don't think so, Hannah, you said no. And no comments from the applicant. Okay, so we're going to close the public hearing with that and move on to discussion uh, for the commissioners. This Commissioner Bloomfield um, seems fairly straightforward to me. Uh, looks like it's an improvement that really needs to be done and. Uh, Certainly reviewing the packet materials seems like they've done a thorough, thorough planning, both on the part of the city of Boulder and review by, by the staff. So um, I feel good about it. Any other discussion or motions? I can make a motion if Sounds there's good. no other discussion. Um, I would move that the Planning Commission conditionally approve docket LE-21-0001 City of Boulder Baseline and Foothills Trunk Sewer Replacement subject to the conditions as set out in the staff recommendations. Commissioner Bloomfield, I'll second. Thank you for the motion, any discussion? All right, we'll do a roll call vote. Sam Libby, aye. Gavin McMillan, aye. Dave Sue, aye. Melanie Nesky, aye. Alicia Gargano, aye. Mark Bloomfield, aye. Sam Fitch, aye. And Ann Goldfarb, aye. Thank you. The motion passes. We'll now move on to our second docket item today, 
get back to my agenda here. So today's second item is docket V-21-0001, the heart cell vacation. And it'll be a presentation from Nathaniel that we'll start with, I believe. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me share my screen for you. If you would please let me know when you can see the screen. Got it. I will also quickly recommend or ask if uh, I'm going to try and put this for myself um, in presenter view, which would allow me to look at my notes. Can you guys see just the screen? Yes. Are you still good. seeing the cover? OK, yeah, excellent. The cover, the cover now looks good. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Planning Commission. My name is Nathaniel Schull. I am Planner 2 at the Boulder County Community Planning and Permitting Department. And today I will be presenting for you docket V-21-0001. This is the Heart Cell Vacation uh, located at 1104 El Dorado Avenue. So a quick project overview. Uh, the owners are Paul and Stephanie Hartzell and the applicant is Stephanie Hartzell. Uh, the request is for a vac to vacate the alleyway between <clears throat> the south 70 feet of lots one through six and the entirety of lots 42 through 48 of block 51 in the town site of uh, Eldora, as well as a triangular shaped portion of old 11th Avenue that is located east of the subject property. Again, the location is at 1104 El Dorado Avenue, which is approximately two and a quarter miles west of the intersection of Lake Eldora Ski Road and Eldora Avenue. And the property is zoned forestry. Here you are looking at a vicinity map uh, with the red arrow pointing to the location of the parcel, uh, which is in the town site of Eldora. Zooming in on an aerial image of the property, um, you'll see the property is included here in the bounded red area. The area is heavily forested. And I point uh, here, out, I'll point out that Middle Boulder Creek runs directly through the center of this property. Uh, there is an existing residence as well, which is pointed to in the red arrow, uh, located on the north side of block 51. It is pre-existing, it's built in the 1920s. Um, and El Dorado Avenue, as you see labeled as well, runs diagonally north and east of the subject parcel. Um, and the yellow areas that I show here are specifically those rights of way that are re being requested for vacation. The uh, center one being the alley, of course, the triangular portion being that of Old 11th. So looking here at the comp plan map, the property includes several environmental features including riparian areas and significant natural communities. I'll also note that the property sits within what's called the El Dorado Avenue's View Protection Corridor. And that's um, identified by some of those circles with the number two on them. This is the floodplain map. Um, as you can see, it's a little hard to see. Um, we did get we got these maps within this scale, but um, you can make out that a large portion of the property is also located within the floodplain overlay district, um, and specifically the Middle Boulder Creek floodway, and that's shown in blue. So staff received as part of the applicant's materials um, this the following map, which you see on the screen. Um, it shows the right of ways to be vacated in yellow. There is on this map an existing cabin which encroaches into the alleyway by approximately eight feet. And the applicant here is seeking a vacation to remedy this encroachment. Additionally, um, as you can note out or make out from the map, there is uh, what's shown as a, a private driveway located on the yellow portion of the triangular area of Old 11th. Uh, the applicant notes in their narrative that they're seeking this vacation of this portion of the right of way in order to keep the access clear to their cabin. In other words, to prevent the visiting public from parking on their driveway. The county has analyzed uh, platted roads, alleys, and rights of way in Eldora, as it illustrates here on this map, uh, which identifies, uh, in, the intent is to identify one, ones of these rights of ways, uh, which need, should be maintained, excuse me, should be retained, 
for the purposes of facilitating access to Middle Boulder Creek, any public lands and or private properties. Um, of note, neither the alleyway being requested for vacation nor the triangular portion of Old 11th um, is noted as uh, should having to be retained by the county. So staff uh, sent out the application and received a number of referrals from various agencies. Um, the access and engineering team commented that the public works department has no current or future plans to develop these portions of right of way. They support the request to vacate the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue, as well as a full uh, 12 foot width of the alleyway uh, between lots one and six and lots 43 and 48. They recommend the applicant coordinate with the owner of lot seven, which is not owned by the applicant, to fully vacate the alley, which bisects their separate parcels, those two parcels. Um, Parks and Open Space commented that the environmental and natural features on the property include riparian and view protection corridors along El Dorado Avenue. Uh, they support the vacation of the alley, but they do not support the vacation of the triangular portion of Old 11th, um, arguing that uh, this may allow for potential expansion of new development towards the east um, and which would compromise uh, both of the features as listed above, but particularly the view protection corridor. Floodplain development team commented that subject parcel is located within the floodplain overlay district and that any future development within this district would require an independent floodplain development permit at a separate time. Uh, staff did not receive any, or had uh, received comments that have no concern from building department and Excel Energy. And then any of the following comments, uh, uh, have, excuse me, any of the agencies below there have no comment. Uh, staff did also send out notifications to adjacent property owners in total 93. Three comments had been received by staff, one in opposition and two in support of the request. Uh, the concerns brought up in opposition included removing the public ac uh, potentially removing public access to Middle Boulder Creek, and then uh, not so much a concern, but more of an argument for being granted half of the vacated portion of Old 11th right of way, uh, in particular because this individual uh, abuts one of the properties, uh, the right of way itself. So according to the land use code, there are uh, several criterion which should be reviewed for vacation requests. Um, I will point out uh, which ones are most relevant here. Um, criterion A, uh, this is an action that is happening right now. So that has been fulfilled. Criteria B, um, specifically uh, the alleyway between one and lots one and six and lots 43 and 48 will transfer to the applicant in full because there is common ownership on both sides of the alley. Uh, staff recommends that the applicant coordinate with the owner of lot seven to vacate that section of alley that bisects those two parcels uh, between these separate owners. Additionally, uh, the portion of Old 11th Avenue will divide evenly in half amongst the two abutting property owners. Um, and then in this case, staff recommends that the triangular portion here of Old 11th um, be divided evenly amongst, um, excuse me, be divided evenly in half based on the proximity of the abutting property's land, which is closest to it, and uh, the allocation or the apportionment of those evenly divided areas to those abutting property owners next to them. So I, I, I will actually defer for a moment to the county attorney to just explain how this relates to the Colorado Revised Statutes uh, in terms of this oddly shaped triangular portion. Hi, this is Eric Rogers, Assistant County Attorney, um, and I can just briefly explain this. So CRS 43-2-302 provides requirements for vesting of title upon vacation of a county road. And subsection D in particular talks about instances um, where the road is not straight or it's not otherwise covered by the statute. And in that case, title to the vacated roadway is supposed to vest in the owners of the abutting land, which with each abutting owner taking that portion of the vacated roadway to which his land or any part is in nearest proximity. So based on this provision, only half of the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue is properly vested in the applicant because his property only abuts half. Um, 
so due to the shape of this portion of right away, you can kind of cut carve the triangle in half as Nathaniel has shown in the staff recommendation with one portion going to the applicant and the other portion going to the abutting property owner, I believe to the south. Um, and though this is different than what the, the in the staff recommendation, it states that um, the county was gonna retain that right away, but after further analysis, the county does not have interest in maintaining that right of way. And so we've determined that it would most properly vest with the neighbor. And I'm happy to answer any additional questions about that. Thank you very much uh, for that contribution. I have one question, it's Commissioner McMillan. I, time for questions now, or do you wanna, you wanna wait until the, till the end? Up, up to you. Can I ask a that's, question? I'd, I'd suggest we wait till the end, if that's okay, Gavin. Okay. Just in case that's they answer fine. it. <laughs> All right. All right, excellent. Um, thank you, I'll, I'll continue in that case. <clears throat> uh, looking at criterion C, um, yes, the processing requirements for vacations will be followed. Uh, D, in this case, staff recommends um, as it relates to um, submitting documents that a condition be added as a recommendation that the applicant provide a new deed and associated legal description to uh, the community planning and permitting department staff for review, approval, and rec recordation. Um, in terms of E, um, staff also recommends the applicant comply with all the comp uh, and complete all the conditions of approval and that the uh, commissioner's resolution uh, be recorded uh, with the clerk and county recorder's office within one year's time, unless otherwise notified or specified. There are also specific uh, condition or uh, considerations as it relates to the Eldora town site when it comes to vacating property, um, those I have listed out here. So, C under C, the board shall consider the following factors as favoring a vacation request. In terms of C1, the applicant's property is currently capable of being accessed via Old 11th Avenue from El Dorado Avenue. Uh, so staff believes this is not a necessary uh, action for access or a clear title. Two, um, the applicant's cabin does encroach into the alley by eight feet. So there is an existing encroachment and therefore this vacation would result in a remedy, a remedy to that encroachment. C3, um, the applicant did not indicate the need to vacate the right of way to accommodate any type of on-site wastewater treatment system or well. Um, so staff believes that this uh, particular consideration is not applicable. Regarding uh, C4, uh, there are, are no constructed roads existing within the alley or the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue. And the closest constructed roadway is El Dorado Avenue, uh, which will be kept in uh, public use. So it, I know I, I listed, as it said in the staff report, that the latter applies, but really there is, this is not, there is no applicability to this consideration here under, under C4. Um, C5, the uh, alleyway, which um, would not provide for development that I, staff believes the alley would not provide for development that is uh, more consistent if vacated, and that vacating the portion of Old 11th Avenue, um, the only way in which that potentially could um, facilitate or provide for development that's consistent is in providing safety improvements to the existing private access, which is already developed on that portion of right of way. So under D, um, the board shall consider the following factors as disfavoring of a vacation request. So D1, um, the alley uh, is encumbered by what is uh, identified in the comp plan map riparian area. Uh, however, the floodplain overlay district also uh, covers this area, which restricts uh, most new development along in, within a floodway. Um, and that new development particularly includes temporary or permanent uh, buildings and structures. Also, the portion of Old 11th Avenue is same is encumbered by the riparian area and the view protection corridor. So in this case, uh, staff recommends a condition uh, because of these uh, specific uh, considerate or these specific factors uh, prohibiting new development on the portion of Old 11th Avenue except for any necessary infrastructure for a driveway maintenance or upkeep. Under D2, um, 
the, as suggested from, I just mentioned under D1, both the alley and the portion of Old 11th have specific environmental features, and that's reflective of the criteria itself. Um, and that the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue includes the view protection corridor. So staff, um, just to repeat, it recommends the same condition prohibiting new development uh, that would be only necessary for improvements to the driveway. In terms of D3, um, there is uh, flooding potential in this area because it is part of the floodway. However, I mentioned the county floodplain regulations prohibit permanent and temporary buildings in the mapped floodway. So really the vacation of the alley would not facilitate an unsafe development since there is a high level of restriction in that area to begin with. Uh, D4, no county owned lands are within proximity or the nearby vicinity requiring any type of access to them. So this is not applicable. Going into E, the board shall not approve a vacation within the Eldora, Eldora town site if, under E1, um, all adjoining lands will have, <coughs> excuse me, will have access to the established public road. Um, therefore, this is not an applicable criteria. Two, uh, two E2, while the roads, no roads are anticipated in these areas, the alley and the old uh, triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue uh, both have, um, oh, I'm sorry, let me start this one over. Uh, E2, <clears throat> there is no current or foreseeable public need for the property, in particular, the construction of any roadway or utilities within this uh, vacated portion of right away being requested. However, staff would like to note that both of these portions, the alley and the old 11th Avenue, still have um, significant natural features and riparian areas uh, which do have certain impacts as it relates to the rural and historic character and environmental resources in the town site. E3, um, the rights of way being requested for vacation are not included in the above listed rights of way and access to Middle Boulder Creek in this case is not impacted by the proposal. Um, staff uh, did in its analysis noted that uh, there is existing public access to Middle Boulder Creek uh, a long undeveloped portion of right of way south of uh, block 51, which is what's called Old El Dorado Avenue. Uh, that is still to be maintained as public access to the creek. Um, so in, in this case, uh, staff believes it is not impacted by this proposal. Uh, and then E4, the rights of way are not necessary for the ongoing maintenance and or existing accepted roads. So therefore this is not applicable. To conclude, uh, staff recommends the community planning and permitting, uh, excuse me, community planning and permitting staff recommends that the planning commission recommend conditional approval for the vacation um, of docket uh, V21-0001 Hartzell vacation, subject to the conditions listed in staff's recommendation and updated uh, based on the county attorney's uh, comments earlier. And at this point, if uh, commission has, plan commission has any questions, I'm happy to answer them as well. All right, thank you. Uh, what questions do we have, Gavin? You can start with yours if you still got it. Uh, I think I do. The, the triangular um, piece of property that is gonna be vacated to the adjacent property owner. Um, who, who is that adjacent property owner? And are they a party to the application or how, how are they brought into the process? Uh, thank you. That's a great question. So uh, the, the applicant, um, I should say the neighboring property owner is Miss Donna Burbank. Um, she uh, was not a party to the immediate uh, signing of this application request. However, uh, she did provide public comments, uh, which suggested in um, uh, a request, at least part of that uh, commentary, she, she uh, asked or argued for uh, the apportionment of that lower half of the triangular portion. Uh, and then again, looking into staff's research um, and the Colorado revised statutes and how they apply, uh, given that she had asked for that within the public comment portion, staff believed it would still be appropriate to allocate that portion to her. Okay. Did that answer Thank your you. question? It does. Um... I may have a follow up, but let me let me think about it for a little bit here. Thank you. Okay, no problem. 
This is Commissioner Goldfarb. In regard to the location of that driveway and uh, divvying up that triangular portion, is the driveway entirely on the property of the applicant? Um, <clears throat> so the out the uh, triangular portion of Old Eleventh, which is one of the subject right of ways to be vacated as a request, that contains a, a majority of the physical driveway. So technically speaking, I don't think there's much portion at all of the driveway on the private property at the moment. It's all on the right of way, and the request is to vacate the right of way so that they can, um, as they said, keep access clear and prevent. The, the visiting public from parking on their driveway because it will become private property. Okay, so so they won't have to do anything to the driveway um, if this is divided, if this triangular piece of property is divided in half. Is that? Or is that uh, what do you mean by do anything? They won't have to do anything to the driveway. Correct. They won't have well, to move the driveway. Uh, oh, I see. Um, so there will be some considerations here. So if you're, this is some, probably a question for the attorneys as well, but the split evenly from, from the point that was suggested in the diagram would, right. on, would leave a small portion of the physical driveway on the, uh, on the Southern part of that triangular portion, which would not go to the applicant, it would go to their adjacent property owner. So I do okay. question how, you know, it's a great question, and I, I don't know if I have an answer for you about that. What they would need to do in terms of, you know, getting that physical access to be on that portion of their private property, the applicant's private property, they probably have to shift it a little to the north. Okay. This is Commissioner Shu. Um, can you go to the picture with the the triangular portion in yellow and the alloy, alloy in yellow, and so we can see the driveway. Yes. Just there you go. while you're getting there, this is Chair Libby. Just a message for the applicant: if you could just withhold your comments till your presentation, so they're on the record. Thank you. So, um, as I understand, the driveway is almost entirely on the public right of way currently. Um, yeah, in the packet, it's called a private driveway. Is that correct terminology? Um, well, it, I, I, I'm not sure how else to define it. Um, it is not a public road or it's not a physical road. It, it, I believe it is correctly termed as a drive or drive access, perhaps drive access to allow access to the private parcel. Um, it is located within a vast, excuse me, a majority of that private access is completely within the public right of way, as you can see here. So I don't, I'm not sure if there's another term that would be better suited. Okay, let me um, rephrase. I guess, does the applicant have a right to exclude people from using that access in the public right of way? as it stands currently? Um, I, it's a great question as well. I, I've, uh, in staff's analysis, we actually considered how the, the intent of the ask of the request. Um, and I, do, I don't think there is a way that the applicant or that, that, that um, staff would in, uh, allow the reason for a vacation simply because it would prevent access for others to use that road. Um, if it becomes private property, of course, the private property owner has the ability to enforce uh, or put up certain signs to restrict access to that private property. Um, I think the concern from staff's perspective would be definitely um, as it relates more to the environmental features of that site um, and then the view corridor and the intent of keeping that protected. Um, and that's why we're you know, suggesting in a considered uh, condition, allowing no new development in that area. <clears throat> I'm not sure if that went off too far on a tangent to answer your question, or I will also defer to my um, 
uh, higher ups, the uh, uh, other members of staff who could possibly answer that question better. Hi, Commissioner. That being Kim Sanchezer. This is Summer Frederick with um, Community Planning and Permitting. Um, the the current status, the 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 applicant's private driveway does cross the public right of way. So um, the 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 answer to your question, the the more straightforward answer to your question, I believe, is a little bit. Um, the public shouldn't be using the applicant's private driveway, but the applicant doesn't have the right to exclude the public from using the right of way. So it's a little bit of a gray area where a, pub, a private entity has permission to have their private access cross a public right of way. Um, and the public right of way is obviously public uh, property. So it gets into a little bit of a gray area. Okay. Um, uh, kind of a related question then with this triangular portion specifically um, under article 10, was it 100 or 101, the uh, C, the factors that are in favor of vacation, are there any that apply specifically to this triangular portion? I did not see any, but I wanted to confirm that. I don't believe that there are. I would concur with that. I don't think there, the staff's analysis didn't find any specifically in favor for the triangular portion. Okay, uh, that's all the questions I have for now. This is Commissioner Neske. Um, I have a question about the public access to the creek. Is it, um, would it be divided in half through the alleyway or did you say it was south of block 51? Um, thank you, Commissioner Ski. Yes, the latter is, a, uh, is what I had mentioned. And I, the map unfortunately doesn't depict this here because it does cut off um, that portion of right of way. But um, the portion of right of way, if you, if you look at um, the map that I showed you that talks to those platted alleys, roadways, um, in the in the Eldora town site here, um, you might actually note that that yellow portion here in the circle is the, re the reference to that uh, public access that says here in the legend uh, should be retained by the county for that purpose. Thank you. Any further questions of the applicant presentation next? We can uh, follow up after that. Okay, thank you to staff for the presentation. Uh, we'll now move on to the presentation from the applicant. And I think uh, you get promoted to presenter status and be able to share your screen and video. Uh, if you can start by stating your name and address to present any information you wanna provide on a presentation, you're welcome to share your screen. And we have about 20 minutes is the standard amount of time, or less, of course. Am I, am I ready? Yeah, we can see you, Stephanie, we can hear you. Okay, go for it. Terrific. My name is Stephanie Hartzell. I am one of the owners of the um, Hartzell cabin that's located at 1104 Eldorado Avenue in Eldora, Colorado. And I do currently reside in Denver, and this is a family property that has been handed down um, through uh, generations. generations. <clears throat> so I'm going to um, present a uh, PowerPoint slide presentation as well um, as going through and explaining um, some things here. So um, I'll probably go off of the video as long as you all can still hear me so that we can show the, um, the PowerPoint. Sorry. 
screen. Okay. Sounds good. No, that's okay. Can you all still hear me? We can. <clears throat> okay, terrific. So I just want to say hello to Boulder County and all the attendees here today. Um, to start, I did want to point out a few errors um, that may lead to a few misunderstandings. Uh, however, as of earlier today and currently now, um, I was informed by Mr. Scholl that there are last minute changes in the recommendations from the county um, and that the Hartzell family, uh, other than this time right now that he presented will not be given the chance to review those last minute changes before making their um, argument to fully vacate the triangular portion of the right of way and the alleyway. So, um, we are, we are now mostly prepared <clears throat> for this, but there is room for uh, questions for sure. Um, I'll try to get through some of this, but we may have to um, ask for a continuance. I don't know if that's something that, that we can do with this, but um, we'll, see, we'll see where it goes. So in the uh, paperwork that was previously given to me on page number one, under the heading discussion, as you can see in this aerial view, slide one, um, 1104 El Dorado Avenue is not at its bend, it is after. So here's the, here's the bend, and this is zero El Dorado Avenue, and here is 1104 El Dorado Avenue. Um, this zero El Dorado Avenue is the portion that belongs to Ms. Burbank, and uh, then moving on to page three, paragraph two, under the CRS 43-2-302, determining the starting point if there is to be a 50-50 split. It states that it's the southeast corner, and it is repeated again in uh, page 10, paragraph one, does repeat southeast corner as depicted under figure three. The starting point should be the southwest corner because the southeast corner runs to the current El Dorado Avenue. And so this is depicted in actually figure number six, not figure number three, which is on the next one here. So this is, to the right is figure number six, the illustration of the hypothetical division, as you can see in this picture, Mr. Scholl does start his drawing from the southwest corner However, it doesn't match up with the verbiage as listed above. In addition, figure six has been altered from the original survey plot, removing the location of the private driveway and added in the King Keyshawn Bridge, which you can see down at the bottom there. It does say El Dorado Avenue. Um, and then as you can see in, uh, slide three, the actual driveway and how it sits in relation to the southwest corner. So this uh, southwest corner is starting with the orange marker, which is located uh, at the southwest corner running a possible 50-50 split would in fact be going halfway through the driveway. So it would go here. Uh, in turn, cutting off our access to our property. Again, on page four, under parks and open space, natural resource concerns for the environment features. We have been maintaining these areas for 38 years come this August with the intent on preserving the land and its habitat, ha habitats. Thus, it states potentially allows for expanding the footprint of the cabin towards the east. As you can see in slide four, what the east side of the Hartzell's cabin actually looks like. We have no intention of building onto the cabin going east. That would destroy the habitat. We have family ashes at their request. And also you state that uh, they state that they disagree with the applicant's rationale for vacating the portion of Old 11th Avenue. 
However, that verbiage, um, it seems like some of that has changed. And uh, so do you now agree with the rationale for vacating the right of way that holds our private driveway? The original argument there are more appropriate ways to handle the stated dilemma. The dilemma is the public parking on our driveway, blocking our access to our cabin and foot traffic eroding the natural habitat. If this portion of old 11th Avenue remains public or belongs to the Burbank property, this will allow anyone to use our driveway either to park on or walk on, as you can see in slides number five and number six. And then seven, this slide here, this shows a letter from Ms. Burbank you can see that my car is parked in front of the driveway for the Hartzell property. It is stated with the orange uh, note there that uh, I am um, a property owner. And Donna did play, uh, Burbank did place on my windshield, do not trespass on my property. You are not welcome to walk on our land, the Burbanks. So what does this really mean if the 50-50 split happens? Let's say the Hartzell family comes up to their property only to find someone parked in the driveway blocking their only access. Then what? We have to turn around and go home because who knows how long these people will be parked there. Also, there is no parking signs posted on the current El Dorado Avenue placed by Boulder County last summer, 2020 preventing us from using that shoulder on the current El Dorado Avenue to park. The Burbanks have all, all of old El Dorado Avenue to park on. So um, will you go to the next slide? So this point right there. So this is old, uh, this is El Dorado Avenue and her property starting here coming down this way for the Burbanks and she has access on this entire side as well, which is old El Dorado Avenue. Uh, Avenue parked on the right next to the, okay, let me see. In addition, they have a circular driveway right in front of their home situated on Klondike Avenue, which again gives the Burbanks no reason to have 50% of our private driveway situated on the current old 11th Avenue right of way. We were told by Jean Ott, the original Boulder County planner intake that we spoke with, that we would not lose our access to our property via our driveway. Even the, um, we can probably go to slide nine, even the assistant Boulder County attorney, Mr. Uh, Latisse, I believe I'm saying the name properly, um, states in email, slide number nine, to the Hartzell family stating, this area includes the area where your driveway is located, meaning you have direct access. So if the triangular portion of the right of way of Old 11th Avenue is not fully vested to the Hartzell family, then the corner property corner property marker would be placed in the middle of the entrance to the driveway along, all, along El Dorado Avenue, excluding us from even being able to park our car on our private driveway as there is natural habitat to the north, which you can see on slide number 10. And it is the, this is the north side of that. So there just simply is uh, habitat on this side and on this side, only leaving a small uh, area to pull into the driveway. Um, let's see, the um, Eldora View Protection Corridor uh, is trying to preserve this area and leaving the potential that someone uh, slash public could block the rest of our only access to our property within the in increase in public foot traffic that would allow for continued erosion of our private driveway and the surrounding habitats. At this time, with all the other Boulder County entities and the majority of the community favoring the full vacation of the triangular portion of the right-of-way, 
The Hartzell family does not understand the parks and open space original disagreement. However, this verbiage um, obviously has been changed somewhat uh, that Mr. Scholl had stated um, that Boulder County and its entities have changed their mind on a few things. But without being able to have time to review those changes uh, at length um, made by Boulder County, this is leading to us uh, to disagree, not only with the county, but with Ms. Burbank and her need to have 50% of the triangular portion of the right of way. Originally in July of 2020, the Hartzells and the Burbanks had a meeting discussing the triangular portion of the old 11th Avenue right of way. This is when Ms. Burbank tried to convince the Hartzell family that she owned old 11th Avenue in its entirety that she would be willing to sell us that triangular portion of the current Boulder County property or swap that piece of Boulder County property with our private access to Middle Boulder Creek. That is illegal and the Hartzells declined. See slide number 11, the Hartzell Burbank email, which confirms our meeting at the Hartzells cabin. Paragraph number, or page number five, paragraph one, agencies with no comments. See slide number 12. Why does the historical preservation not have a comment? I would think they would, seeing how there is a possibility the cabin could reach landmark status. Where does the historic preservation stand at this time? Paragraph five, Page five, paragraph two, opposition expresses concern that the vacation of the public right of ways would close off access to Middle Boulder Creek. However, there is no access to Middle Boulder Creek via the alleyway. See slide number 13. That's the alleyway. It, that's where the cabin is encroaching onto the alleyway. So it is blocking the access uh, to Middle Boulder Creek. The public already has access to Middle Boulder Creek via old El Dorado Avenue to the south side of the Burbank's property. In turn, giving Ms. Burbank full access to Middle Boulder Creek. That 50% portion of old 11th Avenue that originally parks and open space wanted to retain leads to nowhere. Slide 14. If Ms. Burbank has full access to her property from the current El Dorado Avenue and the old El Dorado Avenue, then what is the real reason for her to have 50% of our driveway? Just because it's Boulder County law? What about state law adverse possession? We've been maintaining this property for 38 years and not until July of last year did Ms. Burbank even have an interest in this. So now switching um, to another part of the alleyway between lot seven and lot 42, the criteria review and analysis, which this may have changed. Again, the Hartzell family was not given the opportunity to review all changes. S section B paragraph one on slide 15 states to vacate and split the alley right of way that Okay, go back to maybe it's 14. No, it's okay, just keep going. Okay, um, is to vacate and split the right of way that bisects lot seven and 42. Page nine, number one, Mr. Scholl's recommendation is the alleyway between the sub south 70 feet of lot seven and lot 42 shall not be vacated. So I would um, hope to have an explanation of why is the county contradicting the criteria for which the law is to follow. Shouldn't Mr. Scholl and the commissioners be taking into consideration, this into consideration before making recommendations for one area different from the other area of the vacation? Look at community planning and permitting email correspondence submitted 51821 stating, I need to coordinate with the owner of lot seven. The Hartzell family did reach out to the Elwoods who own lot seven. Uh, and if you see attachment B13 and B14, as it shows his agreement with the Hartzells asking for the 50-50 split of that part of the alleyway between lot seven 
and lot 42. So wouldn't this change the recommendation of the planning committee? Now moving on to page number five, D, conditions after approval. Who changes the survey? Who's going to come out and place new corner markers? If there is a 50-50 split, who comes out to measure it? Who is responsible for payment of these services if there is a 50-50 split? Is it the Burbanks? Is it the county? Or is it part of the Hartzell's application fee? Page number six, C number one. While the first sentence is true, we do have access from the current El Dorado Avenue. However, if the vacation isn't approved in full, then that just reiterates what was said earlier about Ms. Burbank completely excluding our only access to our private driveway, which I find this hard to believe since the Hartzells, again, have maintained this area for 38 years. Um, in turn, leading to what could possibly be considered adverse possession in favor of the Hartzell's private driveway, granting us the full vacation of the right of way. Page seven, number five, paragraph one. The applicant request does not explicitly state any intention of further developing the right of way, thus retaining our intent to preserve, reiterating our intent to preserve all of Old 11th Avenue plus reiterating the county stating it is our private driveway, then why, again, I, and I don't mean to repeat myself, but 38 years the Hartzells have up, done all the upkeep and the maintenance of the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue. Not uh, anyone so, else, not, <laughs> true, not anyone else. So why would this 50-50 split even be considered appropriate? Now, moving on to Slide number 16, page 7D, number one, paragraph number two. Eldorado View Protection Corridor with a rating of number two. What does this mean? Is this explanation in the new recommendations from the county? I, I'm just not sure exactly what all of that covers. Does Boulder County think that if we retain 100% of the triangular portion of the old 11th Avenue right away, that we want to block the view from the current El Dorado Avenue? If so, the county has been misled. In giving a 50-50 split, wouldn't the view protection corridor discourage this as they stated in the last sentence of paragraph number two? Shouldn't they also be just as concerned about Ms. Burbank's possibility to block the view and building there as well? However, if we are granted the full 100% vacation of the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue right of way, our intent would be to put up the rest of the fence that is historic period appropriate. As you can see in the photos, how we have made the integrity of the land and fencing for the 38 years, which sat should satisfy the Eldora View Protection Corridor. On the left is our cabin when it was purchased in 1983. And then 38 years later, this picture was taken in 2020 in, during the fall. Now this leads to the final uh, county recommendations prior to this hearing, which have changed, of course, once again. This is now reiterating in my beginning statement that the Hartzells were not given the chance proper chance to review the new recommendations that we may need to have a continuance due to the county changing the verbiage. So as you all can see, there are many things to take into consideration, but most of all, please take into consideration doing a full vacation in favor of the Hartzell family of the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue right away and the full vacation of the alleyway to include 50% of that portion between lot seven and lot 42, as we have been maintaining this entire area for 38 30, years. 38 years. Um, and I am well aware that some Eldorians might feel wronged by the permanent vacation of the triangular portion of Old 11th Avenue in its entirety to the Hartzells. However, there is plenty of access to Middle Boulder Creek and accompanying trails via Old El Dorado Avenue. As people of wildlife increasingly live in closer quarters, it is not necessary that people have every access the county might allow as people do not need to be everywhere. Thank you for your for listening. The Hartsville team.
thing and go to the video so they can see it. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions for the applicant? Um, this is Commissioner Shu. I, I do have a question. Um, one is if uh, you have uh, the um, vacation of the private driveway, how are you going to prevent um, others from using that that the county is not doing right now? Um, so we would be putting up um, signage uh, for uh, private property, um, no trespassing. We would be putting up a um, time period, a time period uh, fence that is conducive to the um, history of the um, Eldora town site. And we would also be um, indicating uh, where the trail is located down the street um, at Old El Dorado Avenue. Okay. Um, also, I wanted to clarify, uh, you mentioned that recommendations had changed and I wasn't clear if you meant that change since the uh, packet was published last week or that changed yeah. in your, between your discussion initially with uh, the planning department? Um, so it has changed a couple of times from the original discussion. And then as of 825 this morning, I found out from Mr. Scholl that it has changed once again. And we did not have time to uh, review or see any of it until uh, until right now. Right, Commissioner you. Libby, I'll, I'll ask staff to speak to that later as well, Dave, I had some question. Okay. Any other questions for the applicant from the commissioners? Okay, um, so we'll move next into public testimony. We have a number of people signed up, which we'll take uh, testimony from before we get to other discussion and response from staff, et cetera. Um, so we'll go through that list first. People who signed up ahead of time, we have seven folks who've signed up, each individuals for three minutes. Uh, if there are others who wish to speak after that, uh, you can put your name in the chat. Uh, Diana, we already have you on the list, so you're going to be going first. Uh, anybody else beyond that uh, who's, listened, who's not on the list who would like to speak is welcome to put their name and address uh, in the chat, or uh, we'll offer a chance at the end uh, for that. Um, and as we go through with the speakers, um, I believe the way we're doing it today, Anna, is that you'll give a note in the panelist chat when three minutes have expired and I'll interrupt the uh, speaker rather than the buzzer. Is that right? Yes, Anna Milner staff will be employing both methods to let you know when the timer's up. Gotcha, we'll still have the buzzer. Okay, very good. Um, okay, so the first uh, person who signed up to speak is Diana Chavez. And Diana, if you're here, uh, you should be a presenter, an, a promoted to a panelist here in a minute, and then you'll be able to unmute and speak. Chair Libby, Diana has now been promoted to panelist. Diana, you can unmute yourself whenever you're ready. Hello, my name is Diana Chavez and I will be testifying on behalf of the Hartzell family. They are an astounding family who not only cleans and maintains the property of the cabin, but they prevent others from destroying the beautiful land and home that is their cabin. I feel it would be in the best interest of the court to rule in favor of this amazing family. They will not only continue their work to maintain the land and property, will, but will improve the land's value by making adjustments that will make it so the history and wildlife will not suffer, but thrive in their tender care. The heart cells are an amazingly trustworthy bunch that will not fail to keep the best interest of the land, wildlife, and the beautiful historical significance and all that is involved in this case. I implore you to consider them to be in charge of all land that is in their care and ownership. Please and thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, next, we'll move on to Samantha Guyer. Sorry if I have your name wrong. Chair Libby, this is Anna Milner staff. I do not see Samantha on the line unless she's dialed in via telephone. Samantha, um, if you are dialed in at 720-488-4915, can you please press this star is, six? 
This is Commissioner Gargano. I believe she's with Stephanie Hartzell. I'm with my yeah. mom. Oh, so, hello. Yeah. Thank you. She, she's right here. Um, I don't know if that's too bright behind her. I don't know if you guys. No, it's fine. It's fine. Okay. Sorry, sorry for the misunderstanding. Please go ahead. You'll have three minutes. Um, my name is Samantha Geyer. I am Stephanie's, Stephanie's daughter. daughter. Um, as an heir to the Hartzell family, one day I will own this cabin. I don't want people walking or parking on our driveway. Um, it would only make sense to have the whole thing vacated because like in the future this could be considered a landmark status and I really feel like it would just be destroyed if other people park on it or if other people take it away or take the view away so that's it okay thank you for your comments next on the list will be Nicole Hawk And Nicole should be promoted now, so you should be able to unmute and speak. Nicole, do we have you? Nicole has been promoted to panelists. So Nicole, if you can unmute yourself, we're ready for you to speak whenever you're ready. Hi, I'm also gonna go for my mom's phone. It's not allowing me to... Oh, okay. Um, pull up on my phone. I apologize. Very good. Um, my name is Nicole Hawk. I live um, at 5563 East Jefferson Avenue, Denver, Colorado, 80237. Um, this is my family's property up at 1104 Eldorado Avenue. Um, like my sister Samantha stated, we are next in line. Um, so this this part of property is not going to be sold <laughs> in any future sort of thing. It is to be kept in the family um, for generations to come, including my daughter um, and her children and thereafter. Um, I would like the full right of way triangular portion, um, mainly because my family's ashes are there as long as my pet, as well as my pet ashes as well. Um, my great uh, grandfather is buried there. Um, my family has been married there all the way from my aunt and uncle to my mother to myself. Um, we've used the driveway to um, have these events um, and it's been a big part of our lives. Um, time and time again, we've been told that we will not lose our private driveway. So the 50-50 split is kind of confusing because that does leave us with half of our driveway. Um, so you know, would there be a possibility for maybe a 70-30 or, or a 60-40, 70-30, something that we would be able to keep our access, but yet, um, you know, be nice and share. Um, let me see here. Um, I have been told that we are only allowed to either go for 50-50 or all of it. So we are requesting all of it. And I would like to know why, um, the, the view protection corridor would be better kept by Ms. Burbank than by the Hartzells. Why is on one hand, you guys say you need this for the corridor, for the protection, for the upkeep, but then you're willing to just hand it over to someone else. Um, so we wanna make sure if it is divided that there be uh, stipulations as well on the Burbanks to protect the view corridor as well. Um, that nothing, you know, necessarily be changed um, in that area. So I know it's kind of all over the place, but we we would like that triangular portion um, to just upkeep our property. And um, as you guys have seen, keep people off of the property and parking there and limiting our access um, to just foot, foot traffic. We couldn't get in any other way. Um, if you guys please go up to the cabin, I. I allow all of you on the property, go visit it, go see for yourselves what that driveway looks like and um, see how it's blocked daily by neighbors um, and others and see how we are able to get into the cabin. Um, if, yeah, it would, it would just be horrible. Um, thank, thank you, that's all the time we have. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next to speak will be Amalie Pantois. This is uh, no. animal owner staff. Amalie, no, I don't 
see her, her name, join. Yep. Unless she's joined via phone, I do see a call in listener. You'll need to press star six to unmute yourself if you'd like to speak. Okay, we'll move on. We'll come back to uh, check again if she'd like to speak. Uh, next in the list is James Gormley. All right, James, you've been promoted, so we can hear you. Go for it. Hi, guys. I don't have video. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Um, I, I, your, I your name and address guys. first, please. Like oh, 1120 El Dorado, just the neighbors directly to the north. Um, I, I do support the hallway um, vacation. Um, the driveway, I think they're going to have to work it out with the bird banks at some point and switch some property of somewhere else, maybe work out. But the fact that they say they're going to do historically appropriate fencing um, is inaccurate. They have put up chain link fencing, metal stakes, barbed wire within two feet of our house. They've put uh, chains across trees, endangering wildlife, um, tens of yellow signs saying no trespassing everywhere. So if they're claiming that they're going to keep it nice <clears throat> and make it look good, uh, it's untrue. And that's all I have to say. OK, thank you for your comments. Thank you. Next on our list is John Cunningham. So John will be promoted and then we'll wait to hear from you. You can speak. Yes, we're here. Okay, you can just state your name and address and you'll have three minutes. Uh, uh, I'm here with my husband, Bill Pierce. I'm John Cunningham. Our Denver address is 1462 Ash Street. Um, we own a cabin in Eldora. Um, we've been up there for um, over 50 years. So, okay, and so my husband will speak for him. So I, I, I hope you're a little confused because I think the map drawings are pretty poor in this in trying to decide what property we're talking about. So the first thing I have is Nathaniel mentioned this would this end access at the very corner of the property down to the Kishon Bridge? Um, 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 Ms. Hartzell suggested there's other access. There's a, an old, not very good bridge down at 10th, um, but we use this frequently throughout the summer, um, 50 times maybe. I do not see why the whole triangular piece needs to be vacated, to be honest. Um, it, it just, um, I, I just don't see it. What has happened and the previous person mentioned this is lately there's been all sorts of signs and security and chain link and chains um, up around the property. So my very first question is, will we lose access to the bridge right at the corner of the property or not? And um, I'm not real sure from the drawings and the vacation requests um, that that is true. I want that access to stay. And I think many, many of the people in Eldora do as well. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your comment. All right, uh, next in the list is Donna Burbank. And Donna, you've been promoted, so you should be able to unmute yourself and uh, and speak. Okay. Um, thank you. So I am Donna Burbank. I'm the adjacent property owner. Um, I, I agree. It has been kind of a confusing testimony. So um, I, I just give your address, please. I'm sorry to interrupt. Give your address for the record. Donna Burbank, 1090 Klondike, uh, full-time representative of the Council for Eldora, um, and I've been here for about 20 years myself. Um, I did write in a full letter with a lot more testimony on May 14th, so I think that has most of what I wanted to cover, and I think the commissioners have seen that, so I don't want to be 
um, just reiterate every, everything. Um, my first vote was to keep it public. Um, as, as many people have mentioned, that has been, it just seems odd to describe that as a driveway. Um, it's been a, just like every, there's a lot of those kind of crossing roads in Eldora, the other side of 11th Street keeps going. I've been using that for 20 years. You can see the path, even in their picture. That's the path I used to walk to get to my land. Um, it's a very nice piece of land that I walk to, it, you know, that's how I get down to the river. Um, and I agree with Mr. Gormley is soon. Um, so that has been in the family, I guess, as long as I've been there, as I understand it. Um, the, the grandfather of, of the heart cells sort of encouraged people to, to walk down um, to the, to have kind of community access down to the river. When the heart cells moved in or when they started coming up, they come in a few times a summer. I agree, there's been chain link fence, uh, there's been barbed wire fence, there's been a, the, the letter that they mentioned, they basically blocked my own access to my own land with a big fence. They sort of booby trapped the walking area um, with big log, brought logs and rocks. When I tried to ski over there in the winter, that's how I get down to the river in the winter. I didn't see them, you're, you're just kind of tripping over them through the snow. So it's been very aggressive. <laughs> so I've been walking there for 20 years, I don't know, I, I don't know why that's called it driveway uh, that's been a road just like if you go to the other side of 11th Avenue. That said, if it is split, I mean the county uh, outdoor land use code, as it was already mentioned, Article 10-100B, it would be split down the middle. I think one of the commissioners asked what well, normally you would, you would submit this alongside the adjacent property owners. They didn't, so I wrote it in on myself. So I don't know why that wouldn't be split 50-50. And, and if 50 50 is a 50 foot length of, of, of land, the, the, most of the land that's being mentioned is treed. Um, 25 feet is longer than my driveway. So there, if it were split down the middle, there's plenty of access for the heart cells to, if they've put their own fencing or they've put their own rocks or things where they can't park, they can move it you know, three feet over. There's plenty of room to divide it. So it would be very unusual for me to see that why you would break the basic law that it gets split down the middle between property owners. Uh, the other concern I have is that it does, that that alleyway is my access down to the river. Um, and that is sort of from my, directly from my property to the river. Uh, the, the, the conversation that the heart cells mentioned, it was, it was odd, I was trying to work with them. You can see that the, my land goes very close to their property. That's the land they're trying to block, block me from. I, I did sort of say I would, we were getting our land surveyed at the same time that I would sort of switch a piece of land on that side to give them access if I could have access to the river on the other side. Um, and that's where I guess they weren't happy with that. So I haven't had contact since um, in a pleasant way. So um, I, I would you know, e either prefer public access so that people can work, we're sort of allowed to walk there. I don't see why that's destroying the natural habitat. It's a driveway or a road actually. Um, and, and if it is split uh, per county, I would get half half give 25 feet is plenty to park a car. Um, and I would like to request my access down to the river because that was granted before or I get I get half um, or another piece that gets me access down to the river. I shouldn't be not permitted. The, the picture they showed was a little uh, uh, unclear. There's a 10 foot or 12 foot, whatever the alleyway is and there's plenty of road. We could even divide it in half, but I would like to get access down to the river because I had it before. So that's my statement and happy to follow up in any way after the call. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your comments. Uh, next, we'll have some additional signups from the session. Uh, we have uh, Sonia Smith first, I believe. And Sonia, you've been promoted. If you can unmute, see if we can hear you. This is Sonia Smith. Can you hear me? We can, yes. Okay, my uh, address is 15090 East Jarvis Place in Aurora, Colorado. Um, I have been visiting uh, the Hartzell Cabin for many years, uh, going back to 20, let's see, 20 something years that I've been going up there. Uh, the only place to uh, park a vehicle is in the triangular portion where the driveway with a picture is uh, there. You can park there or you can park on the street. However, street signs have gone up or no parking. Um, so I don't visit the cabin um, maybe but once or twice a year. And the only way to uh, access is to either park on the street and or 
the driveway, as we're calling it, in that triangular portion, um, and to you know safely get out of the vehicle because there is a lot of people up there now more than there was you know 20 years ago when I started going, um, and they have stopped parking on the street um, because those signs are there. However, if you um, have to park there to get your stuff out of the car and your kids and your animals and such, it becomes a danger uh, for us to get out of the cars and pack our stuff in. You know, we have to take stuff in to eat and our coolers and water and such. Um, so it does create a danger getting out of the vehicles because people do speed up and down that street uh, quite frequently. Um, and the only way to access the cabin that I know of is to park your vehicle in that spot, uh, which we're calling the driveway, um, and access, uh, as Donna was just saying, is on the other side of her land, uh, is a alleyway or driveway that goes all the way down to the river, um, because I've walked on that myself. Uh, I don't know a lot about the land and all that stuff, but I know there's plenty of access uh, just on the other side of Donna's other land. Uh, the last time I was at the cabin, Donna made it very uncomfortable for me and my family to be there by standing there, taking pictures of our vehicles, uh, being intimidating, and we waved and said hi, and she just took pictures. So we're like, what is going on? Until I talked to Stephanie, I didn't know what was going on. Like I said, I don't visit there often, maybe once or twice a year, um, but it does makes sense to make sure the cabin does have access so people can visit it and use it and enjoy the peace that comes with it. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for your comments. Uh, last, we'll be returning to Amelie to speak. Uh, and you can unmute yourself and give your name and address when you're ready. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Amélie Pontoise. I'm a full-time resident in Eldora. I live at 1120 Eldorado Avenue. Um, so yeah, I'm a little concerned about um, the fences that they're going to put, that they have already put. They, um, they already have excluded all of us residents from this trail, from the public path with um, wood, stumps everywhere in their driveway that you can see on her slide, number eight slide, uh, Stephanie's slide. Um, there's orange, neon orange signs everywhere saying that no trespassing, um, aggressive signs, there's chains, barbed wire. So they are saying that they are, um, they want to preserve the environment and everything, but I'm a little worried about the wildlife crossing the, all those barbed wire and even children. I have three children. Um, I mean, we use this trail all the time and it's, it's becoming dangerous and they've been aggressively pushing all the neighbors away instead of just communicating with us and, and trying to, um, to, to find a good, um, a good compromise. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much all I have to say. There's no parking, there's signs to, uh, no parking size signs everywhere around their property. So they are saying that there's car blocking their driveway all the time, but it's untrue. They, they already have signs saying no trespassing, no parking, uh, and wood stumps that make it impossible anyway to park. So um, this is all I have to say. I'm just um, a full-time resident in Eldora. They come three times a year, and they are trying to change everything, but it's not going to work for us residents here. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, that's everyone we have on the list signed up already or signed up in the chat. I do want to let anybody else who wishes to speak either put their name in the chat or if there's somebody on the phone who'd like to speak, uh, you can also uh, raise your hand with star nine. And I don't think anything else has come through, Anna. Is that correct? I don't see anyone else signed up. Thank you. Okay, hearing no additional comments from the public, um, we'll now uh, allow the staff to make any clarifying statements in response to the questions that were raised. All any right, thank you. From staff, yep, go ahead. Yes, thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, there is a lot of information that was presented, so I'm gonna do my best. Um, first of all, staff would like to 
suggest that they appreciate the corrections that were noted by the applicant to the final staff recommendation as it was originally posted. Um, I didn't write down every one of those as she was going through them, but a majority were correct in her noting those corrections. So I apologize if those weren't typed correctly into the final report, um, but she did clarify uh, some of those uh, corrections appropriately. Um, staff would also like to respond uh, by saying that um, the rationale does not exist uh, for favoring a vacation of Old 11th Avenue as per our staff's analysis, um, necessarily a favoring of the vacation. The reason uh, being that staff has recommended to uh, consider a vacation of this portion of Old 11th Avenue um, is because uh, as stated by several staff, um, including the uh, access and engineering folks, there is no current or future public use intended for that portion of right of way. Um, and then more specifically, the public works staff is actually expressed they prefer not to maintain that portion of right of way. So uh, it would alleviate the responsibility and actually allocate that to the private property owner in that case. Um, also, vacating public land or right of way, specifically with an expressed intent to prevent public members of the public from blocking access to a private lot. Um, is not, in staff's opinion, a very strong argument. Um, staff would really argue that that is largely an, a manner or an element of an enforcement issue in that there needs to be better enforcement done for preventing people from using that right of way uh, for that purpose. Um, so again, that, that's, that's staff's stance in this case. Um, I will defer to, um, Summer, Frederick, or uh, Kim Sanchez regarding the review protection corridor rating of two. I was trying to look at the methodology for that. I actually didn't get the chance to fulfill, to completely um, acknowledge what that in, was uh, intended to mean. And then um, one other comment, staff is following, uh, making this clear, staff is following the specific language for vacating public right of way as spelled out under Colorado revised statutes 43-2-302, which is vesting of title upon property. Um, it is, in staff's opinion, as, as simple as the county following the language as it requires our jurisdiction to comply with the dividing of certain property for vacating property. Um, there is no other intent behind that. Staff is happy to include a condition if needed to require both property owners in this division, that being the Burbanks and the Hartzells, to maintain the specifically defined environmental features of those properties, such as the view protection corridor, you know, tree preservation, if that's needed, that can be an added element. And that's all staff had. Thank you. All right, so uh, last before we close the hearing, we'll allow the applicant to respond to any comments uh, made by public or the staff response. Um, yes, this is Stephanie. Um, I would like to uh, respond to a couple of things that were um, said. Um, I believe that, can I do a, can I do a screen share yeah. on here again, please? Yes, I'll try to keep okay. it brief, but please feel free to. Absolutely. Let me uh, get to this here. So this area right here is a pathway that my brother and I in 1983 started making down to a small bridge that goes to an island here. This is on the Hartzell property and always has been. There has never been public access to this small bridge. The community uh, members have decided to take it upon themselves to have that access. So uh, that, it, it goes right here onto the Burbank property and that's it. Um, and then here is El Dorado, old El Dorado Avenue with trails going to the Keyshawn Bridge to access the other side of the river. So we're not asking for any of that in the vacation in the alleyway. That is to remain public um, access as uh, stated in the uh, in another vacation. Go to the which, colored one. 
Oh, the colored one up here. Okay, hold on just a moment. Let me just come up here. Right here shows a better view of it. So this kind of shows a little, go in more, a little bit, whoops. Sorry. I'm sorry, my apologies. So right here, the it's cut off right here, starting with the Burbank property, but this is our property. I don't know if that makes sense to everybody. So the trail that they're asking so, or talking so about is not during the, the trail vacation. that uh, the, they're talking about has nothing to do with the vacation of anything that we're asking for. And if Donna has been using this for the last 14 years to access Middle Boulder Creek, then she has gone under a railing of, uh, that's four feet away from the, the edge of the cabin right here gone down a slope through the woods, through bushes to get to Middle Boulder Creek. And Go so that, um, that's just kind of odd there. Also, I did want to mention um, the Gormleys um, did say about there being barbed wire fencing. Um, that is correct. We did put up some barbed wire fencing and I'm gonna go back to this slide here. If you zoom in, this is a white school bus that the Gormleys have parked 10 feet over onto our property right next to our cabin. And all all cars these vehicles belong to them. Belong, have been up there for so long and this is total blockage of our access to our cabin. Um, Last night we, so we did put up a barbed wire fence um, as they do have dogs that have come over and defecated on our property. We have asked repeatedly that they move their belongings off of our property and to ensure that they know where the property line is, we did put up a temporary barbed wire fence until we could do the vacation of the property. Um, also, we got a text Monday afternoon from the Gormleys saying, we have noticed you are trying to vacate the Boulder County property, dividing your two properties. We would be willing to support this vacation and have five other people in Eldora willing to support us and therefore you, if you are willing to recognize the old property line between our two lots. I know how important it is for you to not have people walking by your front door. This would be a good way to accomplish that goal. I don't see much support here for it otherwise. Please discuss it with your families and let us know. I hope you have a great day. So are they purposely trying to bribe us to uh, get them to go to say it's okay for the vacation? So when they, when they mention this of how we have been acting, it, it's good for the commission in Boulder County to know how they have been acting and why we've, we've done the things that we've done. Also including um, the fact that Donna, uh, Miss Burbank has come over onto our property while we are there walking next to our car without a mask getting less than six feet away from the corner of our, our porch while we've been there, as also explained by uh, Ms. Um, Smith, Sonia Smith, and that um, she continues to do these things and in her own words, because she is making a statement. And uh, the Hartzell family finds this to be aggressive and intimidating. So, um, that's, uh, these are Donna's vehicles. We uh, found out that the Burbanks were uh, parking on our property. And so for her to park there and block our access, this is yeah. our car behind. Uh, that, There's why no should we have to call her or, or email her and say, can anyone. you please move your vehicle so we can come up? I, I don't know why that, you know, that that should be. So um, then also, could Mr. Scholl please explain what is intended with better enforcement? I, I don't understand that. Is that law enforcement? Is, is, that, is that us with more Law signage? enforcement law? or the signage? The chain link is one chain that goes across uh, 
a corner of our property down by um, Old El Dorado um, Avenue to deter people from walking onto our property. Private property. Um, so um, I think that's all I have to say in response. Okay, is, thank you. Sam, this is Commis Commissioner Fitch. Uh, I really object to going on and on in the private dispute between uh, the Hartzels and their neighbors. We have time limits and public participation, including on applicants, it seems to me. So the issue before us, in my view, is really the criteria for vacation and the, the both our Boulder County regulations and uh, the state statutes. I don't think we have the capacity uh, or the desire really to become a, a mediating or an arbitrating body between a long history of neighbors that are not getting along. So I would like to have yep. the planning commission focus on the planning commission's function, uh, not uh, enforcement of who's parking on what side. I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing uh, and open up for discussion. This is Commissioner Libby. First, Sam, I, I fully agree and was trying to get through the process of letting the applicant respond to any questions that were raised before we get to discussion. And uh, and would have started with a very similar statement to what you just made. This is obviously a uh, complex and personal boundary issue, but what's before the commission is the vacation request and the recommendation from staff. Um, and a number of things that have been discussed are not really germane to that, um, but are people are welcome to share them in their three minutes that they have. Um, so yeah, as we go into discussion, I, I would fully agree that uh, what we should be concerned with is a recommendation to county commissioners based on the criteria that have been presented in the, um, and the recommendation from staff. Chair, Chair Libby, this is Summer Frederick from Community Planning and Permitting. And um, if possible, I'd like to jump in and put forward that um, staff, rec staff um, realizes that there have been a number of questions and possible confusing information presented today and um, that uh, staff does probably think it, it, staff would recommend or think it's a good idea possibly to table this so that staff can go back and um, uh, do some more discussion with the applicant and get some more um, clarity on information as to what is actually going on on the ground. Thank you, Summer. Okay. Um, this is Commissioner Libby, just to continue on that. I, given that, I think I'll make a motion eventually that we do that. If that's staff recommendation, we'd like to respect that, I think. Um, I thought it'd be good to give a chance to make a few recommendations from the commissioners on how things could be clarified in a future continuation of this uh, to make it clearer, since we'll have another hearing and public comment again. Um, the, the main area that I had recommendation around was I think, um, as with anything that has to do with the, the Eldora town site, the, the naming and terminology of the roads and right-of-ways is quite confusing. Um, and so I think when presenting it, there's the legal description, which is uh, what's used in the initial application. I think being really clear to refer to the alleyway and the triangle, for example, or area one and area two uh, with really explicit maps would help everyone understand that very clearly. Um, the county property maps don't properly reflect the shape of the parcel directly to the south of the triangle in my review of that, in that uh, the map shows a kind of a gap there where it actually extends to that triangle. So just some work on the, on the maps being really clear and the naming of the parcels and areas would be really great. Um, that's my only comment before others. I, I'd like to make, this is Commissioner Shu. Um, on top of that, um, yeah, naming areas, area one, area two would be helpful. Also, when you're splitting up the triangle, since half the triangle is also a triangle, if you could do 2A, 2B, something like that, that would be helpful um, to understand what you're, which is the triangular portion. Thanks. Any other discussion from the commissioners? 
Commissioner McMillan, the only thing I would add is I think we need to um, ideally have the property owner to the south if we are going to, in fact, buy this right away, be a party to the application in some in some fashion. Um, but I agree with everything else everyone said, and I, what I'm ready to make a motion to table it to the next meeting. Ms. Commissioner Bloomfield uh, agreed with everything that's been said and the, the uh, motion to table. Um, I would add uh, just some clarification on, I know that there's the three uh, three items that recommend a vacation, um, but some clarification both for commissioners and for the public uh, as to when vacation is allowed, um, I think would be helpful in this case, especially for that uh, old 11th Avenue request. I mean, my understanding is you can make a request to vacate without those three issues and in the case of old 11th Avenue, the uh, county staff said that they would prefer because they don't want to maintain it. So um, just as far as some guidelines as to uh, when that's appropriate. This is Commissioner Fitch. Uh, I would support or second the motion to table uh, since there does seem to be disagreement about the actual uh, time that the uh, parties have had to review the last minute changes in the recommendation. Any other comments? I don't think we've had a formal motion yet, so we'll wait to do that, um, Sam. Um, this is Hey, Sam, this is Erica Rogers, Assistant County Attorney. Um, I just wanted to point out that there have been a variety of legal issues raised during this hearing. And if it would be helpful to the Planning Commission, we could um, schedule an executive session. We don't have to do it today, but you could also move for that. And if that's something that would be helpful to you to discuss the legal issues related to this docket. Thank you. Um, I, I think for me, it's, it's clear and that it's a fairly narrow request of review. Um, there's a lot of other things that relate to property access and enforcement and topics of encroachment that I don't know enough about to speak about, nor would I in our role here. I think nor should any of us really. Um, so I, I don't think it's necessary to have that if we keep it pretty clean with recommendations from staff in the next uh, in the next time this comes up for hearing. I'm happy to hear, have others' opinions on that though. This is Commissioner Goldfarb. Um, I, I don't know that we need an executive session, but I would think that in if if we get a new um, report from staff, that those legal issues could possibly be addressed in that uh, and, and clarify some of that um, based on what we've what we've heard today. This is Commissioner Shu. Um, I also agree that I don't think we need an executive session. Um, I wanted to put one more point out for the staff packet next time. Um, when you divide up the triangular portion into halves, um, can you have a map that shows the driveway with the triangular portion? I think in the packet, we only have one from the applicant and it's not clear if that's the correct um, dimensions. This is Commissioner Gargano. I was thinking the Exact same thing, David. <laughs> um, and I'm ready to make a motion, Sam, if you'd like. Please. Um, I move that we table docket V-21-0001, the Hartzell vacation, um, until we can get um, this additional information on both the legal issues and the help with the maps, and then um, time for the applicant to review all of the updates and changes, and uh, potentially an agreement or work with both sides, both property owners uh, as parties to it, if possible. Uh, this is Commissioner Fitch. I'd second that motion. Okay, thank you, Sam. Uh, any discussion? I just have one piece of discussion, which is to say that um, when, when we come back to this again, I'd, I'd suggest the applicant and all those who wish to speak, try to keep their comments to what we're actually able to review with as this commission. Um, private boundary disputes and histories of that are not really within the purview of this work and we can only do so much to review those. Um, I would love to see, as Alicia said, an agreement brought back by the applicant with the neighbors on, the, on how to resolve some of these concerns, but uh, this is very, quite simply a, a land use vacation, uh, not a uh, crisis resolution 
uh, discussion. So um, would encourage anybody who's gonna be speaking in the future to try to keep their comments as germane as possible to the topic um, for everyone's benefit. I'll do a roll call vote on the uh, motion to table. Uh, Sam Libby, aye. Gavin McMillan. Aye. Dave Sue. Aye. Melanie Nesky. Aye. Lishan Gargano. Aye. Mark Bloomfield. Aye. Sam Fitch. Aye. And Ann Goldfarb. Aye. Thank you all. The motion passes and we'll move on to our next docket. And I apologize. I actually have to step out before the third docket. Um, okay. But I believe we still have enough people that that's okay. We do, yeah. Thank you, Lucian. Thank you. Bye. All right, our third docket today is back to my report here. Docket DC-20-0001, text amendments to marijuana regulations. And I believe we'll have Molly presenting or Hannah. Uh, yes, it's going to be Molly Marcuselli. Let me just share my screen. Okay. Um, and can you just do you mind confirming that you can see the screen and not the the notes section? I will once it's shared. I don't see it yet. Okay, you don't. Um, Yes, we can see it now. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Molly Marcuselli um, from Community Planning and Permitting, and I'm going to be presenting docket DC-20-0001, text amendments to the marijuana regulations. So just a, um, a quick overview of the timeline of this code update. So. Um, in 2019, that's when um, staff did a lot of the research and, and scoping and um, identifying issues to address in this update. Uh, in early 2020, that's when staff received authorization from the Board of County Commissioners to proceed with this code amendment. Uh, on March 12th, 2020, staff had a meeting with members of the marijuana industry to um, identify any potential issues to be addressed in this update. And then in uh, throughout 2020 into early 2021, staff continued researching and scoping and had internal meetings and did a little bit of outreach. And then um, on February 1st of this year, draft regulations were sent out to uh, members of the marijuana industry for comment. And uh, now we are at June 16th for planning commission. So the impetus for this code update was really a change to um, the state statutes related to marijuana. Um, because of the sort of evolving marijuana industry, the state um, tends to update its regulations to, in response to that. And a lot of the times local governments will need to um, update their regulations as well. And so we did identify some changes in the Colorado state statutes that uh, we wanted to address. And so uh, we wanted to also use this update as an opportunity to um, clarify existing code language in our land use code related to marijuana. Um, and we also wanted to use this up as an opportunity to um, touch base with members of the marijuana industry, like I said, to identify any other issues that we may uh, be able to address in this update. And so um, the some of the changes uh, to the state statutes and regulations that we will be addressing in this update. Um, the first one is in 2019, uh, marijuana hospitality establishments became allowed at the state level and uh, local governments, if they wanted to authorize uh, marijuana hospitality establishment, establishments, they would need to um, adopt an ordinance authorizing them. Um, Boulder County has not done that. So we just wanted to make that clear in our code. Um, the second uh, change was that because the state statutes had changed, their kind of like formatting and structure and numbering had changed. And so we just wanted to make sure that in our land use code, anytime we referenced those state statutes, um, they, were, uh, they were the accurate and correct um, citations. And then um, for the sake of time, I'm not gonna get into the issues that we decided not to move forward with in this update as there is discussion around that in the staff recommendation, but I did just wanna 
um, note them here in the presentation in case we did have questions about them later on. Um, and then a few items that were identified um, as existing language in the code that we wanted to uh, that we wanted to clarify. So the first one was creating a definition for alcohol and drug treatment facilities. And in a few slides, I'll get into sort of the context of these and the actual proposed amendments. Um, clarifying in the code that marijuana warehousing is a permitted use. Um, also clarifying in the code where marijuana extraction is permitted and including ancillary educational properties in the required setback between marijuana establishments and educational facilities. And um, in speaking with the industry uh, and also uh, this was mentioned in previous slides because they were also identified by staff, um, a couple issues uh, to be addressed in this update are um, clarifying in the code that marijuana warehousing is allowed and then addressing hospitality establishments. And so just to summarize those last few slides, um, the scope of this update is has these six items here that I just um, talked about in the previous slides. Um, the next slides will just discuss a quick context of these updates and the proposed text amendments. Um, I would like to note, I'm not going to touch on item six since that's just the updating of the um, state statute citations. So just jumping into the summary of the text amendments, the first item uh, is clarifying where extraction is allowed. So um, currently marijuana extraction is only mentioned under um, article 4-516Q, residential marijuana processing and cultivation, which is an accessory use. Um, and our code isn't super clear on where other types of extraction or other levels of extraction, extraction may be permitted. Um, so we, we do, uh, the county does permit uh, marijuana extraction elsewhere. So we just wanted to make that clear in the code. And so we're proposing to just clarify that um, marijuana extraction is allowed as a light industrial use, which also would make it allowed as a general industrial use since any use in light industrial is permitted in general industrial. And so all of the blue is the proposed amendments to the land use code. So in article four, which is um, zoning, 4-506C is light industrial. So we are proposing to add the word extraction into the definition. And then um, number five, additional provisions. For additional provision A, um, we change the wording a bit. So we are proposing that the wording is all required local state and federal licenses and permits, including those related to marijuana must be obtained from the appropriate regulatory agencies. So um, this is not only implying that we do allow uh, marijuana extraction, but we're also uh, requiring any applicable licenses and permits related to that. And then additional provision B, um, the original text uh, reads accessory inside retail sales may occupy up to 10% of the total floor area of the main use. And so we are proposing to also add any marijuana retail sales will be considered a marijuana establishment as described in section 4-512I of this code. Um, just so that, um, just to clarify that uh, marijuana retail sales will be subject to the regulations um, under marijuana establishments. The second item, um, as I mentioned is earlier, is addressing hospitality establishments. So these were, um, and just as a, um, a, re a refresher, uh, hospitality establishments are essentially establishments where marijuana can be consumed on site. Um, and so these, were, these are allowed at the state level as of 2019. Um, local governments do need to adopt an ordinance authorizing them and um, Boulder County has not authorized. So we are just proposing to clarify this in our land use code by um, indicating that membership club and eating or drinking place with or without drive through service as defined in our code are not eligible for this use. So essentially any use um, that does have food sales uh, cannot be eligible to also be a hospitality establishment. And so um, under article 4-504 community uses, uh, F is membership club. And so we are proposing to just add at the end of the definition that this use does not include establishments that require a license under Colorado state statutes related to marijuana. And so we think this um, accurately captures our, um, our stance on not authorizing hospitality establishments. And we'll, uh, we're proposing to do the same thing with the um, article 4-512 under retail and personal service uses. Um, e is eating or drinking place with a drive through service and F is eating or drinking place without a drive through service. And we're proposing to include the same language um, at the end uh, 
that it does not include establishments that require a license under Colorado state statutes related to marijuana. And item three is defining alcohol and drug treatment facilities for the purpose of establishing the setback from a marijuana establishment. So um, one of the provisions under marijuana establishments is a uh, 1000 foot required setback between marijuana establishments and alcohol or drug treatment facilities. Um, however, this requirement is difficult for um, the industry and staff to comply with because we don't uh, have a definition for alcohol and drug treatment facilities. So um, staff worked with members of uh, public health and the substance abuse, abuse advisory group to come up with a definition. Um, and so we, uh, once we came up with that definition, we are proposing to add that at the end of uh, that provision under marijuana establishment. So um, it's the uh, additional provision D. And so we're just proposing the definition, which reads an alcohol or drug treatment facility shall be defined as a facility wherein treatment and 24 hour on site supervision are provided for substance abuse with the goal of enabling residents to live independently when treatment is completed. Um, and then that last section at the bottom, this isn't really related to the alcohol and drug treatment facilities, but um, we are also proposing um, as a last provision under marijuana establishment to just um, include a reference uh, to where um, people can find marijuana warehouse regulations in the code. And this is simply just for ease of navigation by members of the public in the marijuana industry. Um, and we are proposing to do the same thing under the marijuana, regu uh, marijuana warehouse regulations. We wanna just add a reference to um, marijuana establishments. But I just wanted to add that in there for awareness. Uh, number four, setbacks between ancillary educational properties and marijuana establishments. So um, under that same provision of marijuana establishment, that um, 1,000 foot buffer um, is also uh, between educational facilities and the marijuana establishments. Um, but right now it's uh, ancillary educational properties such as um, soccer fields or anything like that um, are not subject to that requirement. And uh, the real intent of this, uh, of this setback was to buffer children in the educational environment for marijuana use is not just, um, you know, properties with the, with the schools on them. So uh, we're just proposing to include um, ancillary properties within that requirement. So under additional provision D, um, we would like it to read, a marijuana store shall not be located within 1,000 feet of an alcohol or drug treatment facility, a licensed childcare facility, or an educational facility in ancillary properties with students below the college grade level. And number five, um, clarifying requirements for the mar marijuana warehouse use. So currently the land use code uh, does not specifically identify marijuana warehousing as an allowed use. Um, however, the county um, has interpreted that it is an allowed use. So we just wanted to uh, make this a little more clear in the code. And to do this, um, we are proposing to just add these two provisions at the end of um, the, so in Article 4-515, uh, warehouse uses, B is warehouse and distribution center. We're proposing to um, add it, uh, provision B, which is the same language found under the uh, marijuana extraction provision. So it reads all required local, state, federal licenses and permits, including those related to marijuana must be obtained from the appropriate regulatory agencies. Um, and this provision basically implies that we do allow marijuana warehousing. However, it will be required to obtain any um, applicable state, local, or federal permits and licenses. And then as I mentioned in the previous slide, we did just wanna add another provision um, referencing where they can find uh, marijuana establishment regulations. And so that was all of the summary of the um, text amendments. And so just a quick overview of the public engagement. Um, and just due to the nature of this update and the circumstances surrounding the pandemic, um, the scope of public engagement included members of the marijuana industry, uh, Boulder County Public Health, and uh, the Substance Use Advisory Council. And um, draft regulations were sent out for comment to um, a county generated email list um, that includes members of the marijuana industry. Uh, we also do have an email list um, for just any county land use code change and then um, public health staff. And after we sent out those draft regulations, we did receive three comments, um, two of which were asking about the absence of any regulations related to marijuana delivery. 
And one comment was just someone who wasn't originally on that email list who had asked to be put on that list, which we, we did um, add them. And so these uh, are the three criteria that need to be met in order for um, to move forward with the text amendment to the land use code. Um, and I won't get into these for the sake of time, but um, as described in this presentation and in the staff recommendation, we do believe that all of these criteria have been met. And so with that, uh, staff is requesting that Planning Commission recommend to the Board of County Commissioners approval of docket DC-20-0001 text amendments to the marijuana regulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, what questions do we have for staff? Uh, this is Commissioner Hsu. Um, with regard to the extraction portion, um, why was extraction added when there's processing or treatment of products in light industrial uses? Um, I would think that would be covered. And, and also food or beverage processing uh, for edibles. Um. That's a great question. Um, I'm not super sure. I guess my understanding was that extraction is a little bit different than processing. And um, I know there's there's different types of marijuana extraction that can be really, uh, I guess, flammable and uh, highly impactful. And so I think they might uh, extraction might um, be its own category. Um, and I don't know if. Hannah is on the call and might have a better explanation, but. I'm here. Yeah, my. <clears throat> Hannah Hipley with Community Planning and Permitting. Um, I, I think one of the main reasons for adding it into the code is because we get the questions specifically about extraction. Um, the purpose here was really to help uh, clarify for the public and the industry. Um, so it's, that was why we added it. It could, we had in the past interpreted it to fall within this category um, because I think we agreed with you, extraction can be considered processing or treatment, um, but because it wasn't specifically called out, it was unclear to members of the public and the industry. Uh, so we felt adding it provided that clarity. Okay. Thanks, Hannah. Um, oh, yeah, I was thanks. just gonna say, um, just to, just to add to that, um, we do have, um, as I mentioned, there's an accessory use, which is residential marijuana processing and cultivation. Um, and so that sort of specifically points out um, the ex marijuana extraction as an allowed use, um, accessory use. And so I think we just wanted to also make it clear that we allow other types and levels of extraction as well. Okay. And then since the land use code uh, refers to extraction of marijuana concentrate and also mineral extraction. Can we change that to extraction of mar marijuana concentrate so that there's no confusion that you can't frack in light industrial use? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. We had um, discussed uh, including cannabinoid extraction, but then I don't know, and Hannah, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe that also includes um, hemp, which we which we didn't want it to, but um, we can definitely clarify that. Okay. Um, okay. I, I'm um, confused. Are you proposing that we would add additional language here, extraction of um, cannabinoids? Something that says it's not mineral extraction. And by mineral extraction, do you mean mining? Yeah, as um, whatever it means in the land use code. Yeah, I understand the concern. Um, we have definitions related to mineral extraction specifically. So our normal approach would be to um, fit a use in its most appropriate use category. So if we have a definition related specifically to mineral extraction, we would put it in that category, not light industrial, if that makes sense. This, this Commissioner Libby, I, I share the same concern that, that David's sharing, which is just to say the word extraction here, is that defined elsewhere in the code? Is it reference to what that is? 
And if not, would adding something like marijuana extraction or extraction of cannabinoids be a way to reduce confusion? If that addresses your concern, then certainly. Yes. Okay, um, I, this is Commissioner Shu again. I have another question. So the uh, 4-512.i about the educational um, and, and uh, facilities and ancillary properties. Mm -hmm. um, what does an ancillary properties cover that is or that would be different if it's not um, included? So if we had educational properties um, and, and maybe as an example, like if there's something like a soccer field that's not owned by the school, like if that's public property, um, well, city or county property, uh, would that be covered when it's being used as a soccer field for a school or, yeah, I, I just don't understand what ancillary is supposed to mean here. Yeah, so um, my understanding is that the, the way it's worded right now in educa our educational facility, um, that to me really just means any sort of maybe school owned property with buildings on it, um, like a school. And so, yeah, I think if there's any other type of property that is um, used for educational activity in an, in an educational environment, um, like a soccer field that doesn't actually have, you know, a building on it or something um, that would be included in the buffer. Just anything related to educational activities. If I could jump in here too again, Molly, thank you. Yep. Um, I think in practical reality, the way that this would be implemented is um, through the ownership record. So we can find out if the school district owns a property. Um, so that, that's how we currently implement this buffer. This is Commissioner Libby. I, I think I had the, same, the exact same question Dave had again about definition. We're trying to give guidance to people so they can read this, understand what it means. And I think having it defined somewhere is really important. I think educational facility is defined as a, as a use, but ancillary properties is not defined anywhere in the code as far as I'm aware. So if I were someone trying to start a business, for example, coming to read the code, I wouldn't know how to interpret this to guide my decision making as to whether I could be approved or not. If it's subjective and they'd have to work with staff, that's that's okay. But if there's a way to define it more clearly, that's a recommendation I think we could make. Uh, this is Kim Sanchez from um, Community Planning and Permitting. I think that we can um, make that clarification. I think those are, are well noted um, comments. What we are trying to get at is the playground or play field issues that are associated with a school. So not just the building itself, but where kids would be congregating or playing or um, people would be um, potentially impacted. So we can maybe put in a parenthetical that um, provides uh, such as, you know, play field, soccer field, or, or whatever, um, just to, to further clarify that point. Thanks for those comments. This is Commissioner Goldfarb. I have another comment in regard to that. Uh, when I read ancillary properties, again, felt that that was a bit vague. Um, I'm wondering if we could say ancillary properties and facilities, um, since we've referenced educational facilities. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I would, if you're going to do a such as, I would say including but not limited to whatever it is you're gonna put in there, just in terms of the actual language. Good suggestion, thank you. This is Commissioner Libby. I had one other just question unrelated to this. Um, you mentioned in your last slide, Molly, about the comments around delivery topics. Mm -hmm. I think in the staff report, you discussed why that wasn't included, but if you could just briefly cover that for the, uh, the record here. I couldn't find the reference in the doc quickly. No problem, of course. Um, yeah, so we, uh, we actually are um, working on an ordinance related to delivery, but that's um, more of our licensing team. Um, and from a land use perspective, we didn't feel that uh, marijuana delivery would really have land use impacts. And so we didn't feel it was necessary to address in the land use code, um, but our licensing team is, is working on that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. This is um, 
I have a question about the hospitality establishments. Is this something that the county commissioners have actually reviewed or is it just something that hasn't come up since the state change was approved? Um, yeah, my understanding is that they had specifically um, requested that we do not authorize hospitality establishments at this time. Um, I don't know if maybe Kim or Hannah has a better answer for that, but that was my understanding. Is, it, is that to say that it's like sort of an informal request of staff or that they've actually reviewed it? I'm having a hard time. Mark, it's a bit it's hard to hear you, yeah. So I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> Just keep speaking that way and we'll get you. <laughs> All right. I'll try to project a little bit more. Um, I had just a question of whether it sounds like that's a little bit more informal uh, request of staff than it, than it was an actual review. Um, I guess I'm just wondering if it would be easier to have language in there that says, you know, this is not allowed unless the county commissioners approve it. No matter if they do approve it, doesn't have to be changed. Yeah, I under, I, yeah, I think I'm understanding. Um, most likely if the commissioners did move at some point in time or you know, the county moved to a place where they wanted, we wanted to expand marijuana uses in the county, um, we would likely be creating a use for that type of establishment rather than um, fitting them into the uses that we have. So I think there's a, um, that's probably how we would address that in the future. So that would require uh, amendment of this anyway? Yes, we would need to amend the code at that time to allow a hospitality establishment and determine, you know, what zone districts those are appropriate and any other um specific distancing requirements and those sorts of things that we would probably want to apply to those types of establishments but not necessarily to our restaurants and the okay that satisfies me yeah and i think with the direction we were given to not authorize them yet i think this is just an effort to clarify that and i think in this particular update, as I mentioned, um, just the nature of it, we weren't, we didn't um, do extensive community engagement. And I think maybe creating regulations for hospitality establishments would require more engagement than we were uh, equipped to do this last year. This is Commissioner Goldfarb. I have um, a couple of questions. Um, is there a definition somewhere in the county uh, regulations code um, or the state statutes which define marijuana establishment and marijuana store? Um, I think we, we have a definition for marijuana establishment. I'm not sure about uh, the state statutes. I think maybe Erica, you would be a little more familiar with that. If she's on, not sure if she is. It's Commissioner Libby, I can, I can confirm it's it's defined in the, in the code. Marijuana establishment. Uh, I don't know about marijuana store. Yeah, that's that's the crux of what I'm getting at. Is it's it's, uh, it's a subcategory of a marijuana establishment. Right. I understand that. Um, but does that need to be more specific is what I'm wondering. And this is Erica Rogers, Assistant County Attorney. Um, I can check the state statutes real quick and see how they define mar marijuana establishment if you just give me a second. Okay. Um, let me, I've got a couple other questions too. Let's see here. Um, Okay, let's see. Well, I'll just I'll just wait for your response on that one for now. 
we'll give Erica a chance to pick that up and find it. Um, any other uh, questions for staff? We still have public comment to go to, so we can come back after that as well for more discussion. I'd suggest that we wait and uh, cover that Erica's response in the discussion. That's okay with you, Anne? That's that's fine. Yep. Okay. I know we have somebody who's waiting to speak, so I want to get to them and we can yes. proceed through that. Sure. Okay. All right. So we'll finish with questions for staff and move into public comment. Um, I think we have one person signed up to speak so far, Anna. Uh, anybody else who wishes to speak and put their name in the chat with their address uh, or raise their hand afterwards. I see our attendee list has grown small. Uh, Dylan Donaldson, are you with us? And can we promote Dylan so he can uh, make his testimony? Dylan is in the process of being promoted. He should be available shortly. Congratulations, Dylan. Feel free to unmute and you have three minutes. You can state your name and address, please. I'm here. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Dylan Donaldson. My address is 5854 Rawhide Court. I'm owner of Caring Kind Dispensary. Um, really happy to get some face time with uh, the new members of the, the commissioners here. So thank you for that. Um, I guess my only real comment to the overall theme of this as we try to get the county regulations to align with state regulations and kind of clean up some of the questions staff had about extraction and marijuana store versus establishment. Um, the state does have clearly defined license privileges. Um, and so I think it would probably be more clear and best, if, especially if we're trying to align with the state to use the same terminology, uh, retail marijuana store license, uh, marijuana fused product manufacturing license and marijuana cultivation license. Um, I think those could easily be uh, rolled in instead of using the word extraction or store versus establishment. It might just make sense to um, use the same um, titles and labels as the licenses that the state gives out. Um, and that would help uh, the regulations clearly allow for any use permitted under those license by the state, uh, including extraction, cultivation, sales, and all that. So that's my only comment. I think it could be uh, more easily clarified um, for the public to just align with the state's titles for the different types of licenses that can be applied for and, and held. And that would probably clean up a lot of the confusion here um, in these changes that are being proposed. And that's all. Thank you for your comments. Uh, is anybody else who would like to speak from the uh, attendees on the phone or uh, on the Zoom session? And seeing none, Anna, you have no other names, I assume. I think we're good. Okay. So I will now um, close public hearing uh, from this public comment and move into discussion. Um, I think the first topic that we have was any response uh, from Erica on those definitions? Yeah. Hi, Commissioner Goldfarb. This is Erica Rogers, Assistant County Attorney. Were you looking for kind of Marijuana. So I'm looking at the state statute. There's a ton of definitions. There's marijuana hospitality business. There's medical marijuana store. There's retail marijuana business. There's retail marijuana hospitality sales and business. Um, which which one were you kind of wanting to figure out there? Well, I, I think what uh, the comment that Mr. Donaldson just made was um, excellent. I think that I would like to see the language that we're using here track with the state statute so that we don't have the confusion as he as he mentioned. And I think that that makes it easy just to use that language, um, makes it clear to the public exactly what you're talking about. Um, to me, marijuana store is just, it's, it's, too, it's too general, it's too generic, it's unclear. Um, so I would I would advocate that we that we track the language of the state statutes whenever possible. If I might jump in and just respond to that momentarily, um, I, in some ways um, the zoning is not intended to match up with state statutes. The state may permit things that the county has decided are not appropriate within the land use code. Um, 
I think the other complicating factor we have at this point in time in doing sort of a wholesale redefinition of marijuana establishment um, is we create a, a non-conforming situation with our existing establishments who fell in this definition. Um, so uh, there was some discussion um, as part of this update uh, to, to look at the marijuana establishment definition and maybe break it out into different pieces and parts. And the, the reason that we did not move forward with that is that in large part the non-conforming issue. Um, I think if there's a, a question about what a marijuana store means in, in our code, we could add some clarifying language there. Um, yeah, I think that would be I think that would be good. I, I, I'm not advocating that we go in and, you know, change definition of marijuana establishment, but I, I just I think that that the reference to a marijuana store is too general. I think it might help us if, if you could um, is how how can we better clarify that? I think from a staff perspective, we get so used to working with this definition, you know, in my mind, a marijuana store is a place where you can buy marijuana products. Okay. Is that is that the kind of clarification you're looking for? Is is there a definitional section in the code that defines marijuana establishment? It, there is, yes. Yes. And so is there a definition for marijuana store? No. So when and there's so not a specific definition, the code reverts to kind of normal English understanding of a word. I understand that. Um, but I would think that if we're going to define marijuana establishment, we could come up with a definition for marijuana store, just like, I mean, you just told me what you think marijuana store means, and that's someplace that sells marijuana, you know, medical marijuana, recreational marijuana. Um, I, I would just, I like definitions. I like it to be clear. I think adding and, that clarity is pretty, we, we, can, we can do that. Yeah. And then kind of along those same lines in um, 4-515 warehouse uses under five, uh, five where it says additional provisions. C there is for marijuana establishments referred to section 4-512 I of this code. I, I, I think what you're talking about is regulations. Uh, just for marijuana establishments, that doesn't seem like very precise language to me. Yeah, that was really just a, um, as I mentioned, just for ease of navigation for people using the code who might not be familiar with it, if they're looking for a specific right. yeah, um, I type of- that. I think that if, if you said um, for marijuana establishment regulations, please you know refer to whatever this section 4-512I. I see. Right. My, my background as a legislative drafter <laughs> comes out, sorry. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that comment, thank you. So you are you proposing to just maybe add regulations? Yes. Word regulations, okay. Yeah, that would be fine. Great. Any other comments from the commissioners or questions before moving on? I had a follow-up question if it's still open to the public. It's not open, I'm sorry. Okay. We'll close that. I'm sure Molly will be happy to take it by email though. Yes, I would. All right, commissioners, anything else or a motion? And uh, the, the motion request would be to, um, to the county commissioners to recommend approval. I'll make one. Uh, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners approve docket DC 20 001 text amendments to marijuana regulations. Commissioner Bloom, do you have a second? Is a second? Any discussion? Um, yeah, I have a question. So the you know, suggestions we have, are they captured in this recommendation and, and our? Um, that, that was my assumption. Yeah, that was my assumption. I can be clearer, but generally when the discussion that's on the record during this meeting is incorporated into the staff changes that go to the commissioners. 
okay. it wouldn't just go like as is that changes would go into it. From a staff perspective, it is sort of, it is helpful if the recommendation includes um, recommending approval of the docket as um, um, with the included edits recommended by planning commission. So just so we're clear, you're recommending approval based on the changes that you requested from us today, correct? That's right, I'll re, I'll re motion so we're clear. Okay, thank you. Yep, <laughs> I'll try again. Uh, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the Board of County Commissioners approve docket DC-20-0001, text amendments to the marijuana regulations with the inclusion of suggested changes and edits made during the discussion of today's meeting. Commissioner Bloomfield, I will re-second. Any discussion further? All right, I'll move to a roll call. Sam Libby, I, Gad McMillan. Gavin, you there? Sorry, did you hear me? I, 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 sorry, I did not, did not hear you. Uh, Dave yeah. Sue? Aye. Melon Nesky? Aye. Mark Bloomfield? Aye. Sam Fitch? Aye. And Ann Goldfarb? Aye. And Leishan is no longer with us, so the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, that is our last doc item for today. Um, so I'll go ahead and bang my gavel on my desk here and adjourn the meeting if we have a motion. Sam, I've got a quick question on the sure. uh, the Hartsall vacation. Did we table that to a specific meeting, to the next meeting? We did not. It was tabled uh, not to a meeting or indefinitely, but I think indefinite is the assumption. I don't think Leishan said indefinite, but uh, it was not a specific meeting. Okay, thank you. Any clarifications from staff? That was my rec recollection. Uh, this is Kim Sanchez. I think we'll work to bring it back to uh, the next planning commission meeting if we're able. Commissioner Bloomfield, I move to adjourn. I second. Uh, we'll do a, a voice vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right. We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Have a Thank nice you. evening. Thank you.